Hello everyone, I'm Chris Wynn and welcome to the Walker Report podcast in association with Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen where today we have something a bit special and we're speaking to someone who's had a couple of spells at the club during some fantastic times for Sunderland. As a player he played for the likes of Birmingham City, Walsall, Blackpool as well as with Sunderland Royalty at York City, which I'm very much uh, looking forward to getting into. Uh, and then after hanging up his boots, he became one of the most respected coaches in the game. He ended up as the manager of Sunderland just over a decade ago. Uh, today, we're very pleased to be speaking to none other than Ricky Sprazier. Hello, Ricky. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for the invite. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks again for joining us. How are you keeping? I'm good. In general, I'm good. I think I've been about three years now out of the game you know so um, I've done 47 years and it's been a long time and it's been a long time travelling to be honest with you so I thought it was a bit time to come out of it and stay at home and spend some time with my wife yeah when you say when you say home now is that is that around the York area now yeah I've always lived here I've, I've lived here since about 82 but we moved yeah. when I obviously went to Birmingham we uh, married in uh, 76 and lived in Birmingham then we um, I joined Walsall uh, but I still could commute you know, um, so I commuted there with a, a player called Roy McDonough, who used to be a centre forward at Birmingham. They bought it, they actually bought it to us. And then I got a free transfer, which you, you never really want. And then Alan Ball picked me up at uh, Blackpool. So we moved to Blackpool. I had two years there. And then I moved to York City in the 82. And then we then set up a home here. So when, when I stopped playing in general, um, the, our two girls at the time were doing education, which was really important to us. So the decision was that I would travel and uh, the, the family would stay at home and the, the girls could stay at their own school. So um, so I'd been, I'd been doing that since, um, well, 82. Like I came to Sunderland in 94. From 94 onwards, I've always been seen to be travelling. So I think it was about time to give it a rest. Yeah, I mean, a be- beautiful part of the world. I, I love York. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, when we were talking the other day, you, you mentioned you... You, you, you know, on the odd occasion, bump into the, the Gabardini brothers and a, and a few yeah. others around the area. Yeah, I mean, Gabbers is, uh, they've, they've got an old York boy, he's now on Instagram, it's run by Andy Mack. <laughs> so um, a lot a lot of the players have joined that and, and Ricardo's joined that, Marco's joined that. Mar- Marco had um, um, a hotel um, mm. just at Allgate Bridge, but he's actually sold it now and, and so did Ricardo with his mum and dad. But they, uh, Ricardo's bought a smaller place and he, They've got theirs at Fulford. So I bumped into Marco and the last time I bumped in was probably about a year ago. Uh, I bumped into him. So uh, lovely lad, good player, mm. you know, and uh, I've got a lot of time for the ball. So I've got a lot of time for the family because the family have yeah. been absolutely great. And then, um, so now and again, I just bump into people. And so I'll be honest with you, sometimes I don't recognize them. So, some will be young <laughs> apprentices I had back in 82, <laughs> you know, and maybe 80, 86 mm. when I became a coach, although I only knew them then. But, uh, mm. Yeah, so it's been it's good. York's a lovely place. I, I don't get any hassle, which is important to me, and I can go out and enjoy myself and uh, and then uh, enjoy the lovely city, which it is. <laughs> yeah, and and I mean, obviously, in the, in the introduction, I, I mentioned uh, some of your clubs during your your playing days. Um, I mean, you, you told me a story before uh, we recorded um, the other day about. Um, you know, you were talking to your grandson about <laughs> about what you would what you actually did as a footballer, and that that you were a footballer. But I mean, it, it, you know, being such a highly regarded coach in the game and doing what you've done on that side, do you think a lot of people forget that you were a player? Yeah, I probably was a better coach than a player. I, I, I didn't do bad as a player. I um, I made my debut. I think I was eighteen. I played him against Leeds United when Brian Clough, maybe nineteen. Brian Clough was the manager. Uh, we lost 1-0 when Alan Clark scored. And then ne- the next day, I sort of dislocated my fibula. Um, and so I was out for about 20-odd weeks, 25 weeks, and never really recovered from it, to be truthful with you. Um, so I probably played off and on about 40. I'd been coding subs. But mm. I felt I needed to play. I needed to play week in, week out. I, I didn't mind the early part of my age playing at the football combination. But then I had a goal to to try and play in the first team, you know, and it was restricted because there was better centre-backs than me. The, the, the two older ones were Roger Hind and John Roberts, who John Roberts was the Welsh international captain. He was like Gath, and Roger wasn't far off it, you know, so, um, and then Joe Gallagher was there, and, you know, so I, I got offered a two-year contract in 78 uh, through Jim Smith, and I asked them if it would be possible could I, I go out, you know, 
if there's a possibility a club would show interest. And, and I signed a contract, and within about three months, they, they sold me to Walsall, but, which was great for me because um, I wanted to play first-team football. I was, I was at age probably 22, and I needed to play, you know, and uh, I needed to test myself, to be honest with you. But <clears throat> my early part of Birmingham, maybe 17, 18, I, I did a prelim coaching badge, and it was part of the apprenticeship we had. And uh, Mick Bailey took us from Wolverhampton, an old midfield player. And I can remember um, having my test and I was doing shooting. I can remember doing shooting. And then it was just this mud field we're in, you know, and with a goal that's bent and all that. And then turned around and just seen all these kids running, all ages, all sizes, and thought, oh, my <laughs> God, what am I going to do? You know, this is – I've never been in this situation before. And it was never I could – but I managed – just about to get through to it. And then from mm. then on, a friend of mine had asked me to coach one of his teams. I used to go with Paul Hendry and, and I called Jimmy Calderwood. And they, they came down from Scotland and um, one of their friends asked me to do some coaching for the team. So I said, yeah, okay. So I did it. And I did it in a place called Broadway in Moor. I did it there. And um, I did about seven, eight weeks. And it was good because it got me out at night. You know, instead of being in the digs, I thought well, it was a bit different, meet people and all that, you know, and I got a bit more experience in coaching. But what I didn't realise, Chris, he worked for Ansel's. So <laughs> my payment was uh, was uh, beer vouchers, my payment. <laughs> and uh, I was the most popular man in the Broadway pub. <laughs> to forget. And there was about, about 12 of us. I never drank at that time. I didn't drink until probably 2021, but... Um, and then um, I used to put the well, like bingo tickets. I used to put them behind the bar and the barman knew us all. And I used to say, when the lads come in, just, just give them whatever they want. And so that's what happened. And from then on, I used to get these raffle ticket beer tickets, you know, and we, we used to go to Broadway, mm. you know, and I just put it down. I, I'd probably have a Coke at the time. They were on, I think it was at Snake Bikes. I think it was Cider or Lager. They were on at the time. So. So I was popular until I uh, thought, well, that's it. I think I'll, I need to focus a bit more on myself. <laughs> but I was popular. It was the first time I think I'd been really popular with everybody in the pub that I knew. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it was quite good. It was a good experience. But that probably 72 was, 73 was probably my first time I did coaching. So but as mm. a player, I went to Walsh, so I did well for two years. Did really well at York. Blackpool, I got an Achilles injury, which you don't actually sort of think of you just don't think of injuries and then I just thought then you know, what am I going to do and I got I, it came to a situation when it had the old um, transfer thing I think it was about March you know it's after it like, stopped in March and I can remember nine of us going in Willie Morgan the old my United player was at Blackpool um, mm. and being told that the club are really struggling and would we have their contracts paid up and, and so we all agreed um, and uh, I played. We played for his else couldn't play for the first team then, and then uh, then thinking, what we're going to do? You know exactly what we're going to do after football. You know, and um, sent away. Got, got a reply from Hong Kong. Uh, got a reply from um, Rochdale, and I got a reply from York City. Hmm. You know, so it was. Um, I was going to be a red coat at, at Pontins, which was only about <laughs> ten minutes away from my house uh, I just couldn't see me doing that a bit just for a minute but yeah so uh, there was that side of it you know and yeah. you, you know you get your family and I thought I'll go in the pub trade I'll do that I did two years at Tetley but that was hard work that was really hard work and I couldn't see my family the girls dealing with that either or my wife so yeah. I uh, focused more on the coaching no no unfortunately for me I, I managed to pass my badges managed to pass yeah. my badges and then um, and then being lucky really just being really lucky and, and getting a job, you know, and, and Dennis Smith did fantastic for me in 86 when he offered me a lap player coach. Well, I, you, you can't play and coach the young players. You just can't do it. You've either got to focus on one. So I've asked him, look, can I go coaching? I didn't, well, he didn't tell me he was going to half my wages. He didn't say that to me. He says, ah, OK, that sounds a good idea, you know. So I wasn't paid much. <laughs> so I think it was. <laughs> Dennis was the first one to really 
off oh, giving me a job at York City. Yeah, and I mean, just in terms of, like you said, those injuries coming through, um, because, um, like you said, you you were at Birmingham with some big names like Trevor Francis and Howard Kendall when you first went there, and and then you made that move to to Walsall. And and I was wondering, and I was just kind of looking looking at it before. Was it was it um, Alan Ball who signed you for for Blackpool? Yeah, it was Alan Ball, and and um, we um, I think Walsall bought Roy and I for about forty. Um, I think Roy was still there, and then um, Alan Buckley was the manager at Walsall, and everything was okay. And then yeah. uh, he didn't offer me a contract. No, he did. He did offer me a contract, but then it basically said I was a club, club quite interesting. So uh, I went and spoke to Alan Ball, who, who was fantastic. Um, you know, when you talk, <laughs> you talk about things. You know, you say like, like what am I going to ask for? And what do you think I'm worth? And <laughs> and everything you ask for, your wife probably turns around and says, "Oh, you should have asked for more." <laughs> but what, what what was strange about this one when when I went to see Alan Ball, I went in to talk about my my deal, um, and he offered me two years, which which was great, and the money was good, everything was good about it. But he brought my wife Joan in, and uh, she he said to her, uh, "And what do you think?" She just she didn't know what to say, and uh, he, he did say to he turned around and said to her, "If you're happy with it, then everything's okay." You know, we'll we'll do the deal, and she went, "Yeah, I'm fine. Everything was okay that way." You know, it's <laughs> it's the first time she's really been put in the spot by a manager about my wages. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so it, it, it was fantastic, Alan Baller, and we had Ted McDougall, who was the uh, the the coach, and Ted was fantastic. There, there, there was obviously there's always that trouble in the background with the chairman and things like that. We you don't quite you read it, we don't quite actually see it. Uh, but um, it was great, you know. And they said with Dennis at, at York, Viv was me at York. Viv, Viv was was fantastic. And Dennis in the morning used to split us all up. Chris he used to split us up, and he sort of he go okay, uh, split ourselves up, get into two groups. Some years with Viv, the rest years with me. You know, after we Viv, hit me. so everybody would go to Viv. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis used, used to pull everybody back, right? McPhail, you get in, you're a defender. Ricky, you get back. Hey, you get back. Stevie Senior, you cut. We used to think, oh, God. Because Dennis, Dennis was lovely, but boring. Viv had a sparkle about him. Love little things, little football. That Dennis was like running a little bit, getting the exercise done. So everybody, so eventually I think Dennis stopped that. <laughs> he just said, right, you half, you're with me. That has me, Viv. But uh, yeah, but they were lovely. They were lovely people, and I learned a lot from them as well. well I think you were only. I mean, I was. I was looking back. I might be wrong, but I think you were only about twenty six when when you joined York. And obviously, a lot of Sunderland fans are going to be familiar with with, with Dennis Smith. But um, I think he was only appointed a couple of months before you arrived as well. So. I mean, in terms of him replying to your your letter saying, you know, that you sent to a few clubs, um, I mean, could you see that Dennis Smith was trying to build something and getting some kind of good coaches, or, you know, you know, replying to the likes of yourself, Viv Busby was there. Could you see what he was trying to build? Yeah, I think when I got there after a while, you know, the people he brought in, I mean, there's a great story about that because uh, when we lived in Blackpool, Rochdale had offered me far more in New York City and, and uh, more years in my contract. But, so I went up there and spoke to them, and then three days later, they asked me to go up again to speak to Rochdale. So um, I went up, and, and I'll be honest here, I went up the M62, came off at the Rochdale, sending went round the roundabout back on the M62, back to Blackpool. I did. Um, and my wife, Joan, said to me, God, that was quick. I said, I couldn't go. I just couldn't go, you know, and I don't know why, I just... Maybe I was thinking just to thought of Rochdale on Spotland and things like that. I just couldn't go. And I know Dennis had offered me sort of typical Dennis would offer you three months, six months. Dennis, mm. you know, so I said to him, look, Rochdale offered me two years. I've offered me signing on to you. I can waiver that. I don't mind. I don't have a problem with that. So knowing Dennis being so really kind hearted, he offered me a year. <laughs> so <laughs> I went, I went for the year. Uh, and then obviously um uh, I played with Dennis, I played alongside Dennis. Um, who, who was like, fantastic and uh, the place was bubbly the chairman there was Michael Sinclair was the chairman uh, there was um, Mr Webb there was Barry Swallow there was Mr Howden there were fantastic board members and they come in it was a right family atmosphere and then obviously McPhail came and Alan Hay came but the, mm. the thing about Dennis Dennis had been there as a player coach so Dennis mm-hmm. knew what was there and what he needed 
he needed, you know, it was probably six months before he became manager. So he had Bernie up front, who, who was exceptional, he was an exceptionally good player, and Gavi Ford and the big Keith Wall went up front, mm. you know, and big Mally Crosby, my God, it's like suddenly all over, Mally Crosby yeah. in, the, in midfield, and he brought in Sean Hazelgrave and Stevie Senior. So the back four was like me, was Chris Evans, who used to be at Arsenal and Stoke. Chris came as me, Chris, and John McPhail and Ali here with the back four. Um, but um, we, we did well the first year. Did really probably better than what Dennis thought. And then the second year, it just went for us. We, we brought in, I think he brought in a couple more, you know, so it was dope. Like, Bernie was still there. Bernie was terrific. Keith, Keith Wall and Bernie were a fantastic pair. And, and so was Ford. And then they'd old, they'd Polly, Pollard in there as well. And, um, but everybody, what he did, we used to go out on a Tuesday. We were told to go out on a Tuesday afternoon. We used to run on a Tuesday, a really hard session on a Tuesday. And it was compulsory. We had to go to the Bootham Tavern to have a few pints. So we used to be there for about half one. So then you're talking about 1983, 84, you're talking about this. And then, yeah. um, and then after that, the younger players would go somewhere else and the older players would probably go home. <laughs> they like saying. But we'd, somewhere we'd be out to two in the morning. We'd go home about eight. The sort of older ones, we'd go about eight. And then, but it was compulsion. We had to go and it, it gave us a bond, a really good bond. We got to know each other and they all gelled together. And as a unit, they went out together. You know, and um, I can't really mind in the dressing room anybody having a go at anybody. It was always positive. We, we knew we'd make mistakes or we didn't do as well. We knew all that Dennis did, but um, and then Mali came in as a youth team coach as well. And then here's another one for you, Roger Jones, goalkeeper. Yeah, in goal, goalkeeper, yeah. Yeah, you know, so the, the, the experience of people who played in Division One at the time or the Premier, the Division One, who were free transfers. And then, uh, but at that age of 25, 26, 27, and they uh, still had another, a number of years ahead of him. And, and he'd he done really well, to be fair. He was super like that and well backed by, I'd say, Mr. Sinclair. Colin Webb yeah. um, did the youth. He, he was fantastic as well. So it was lovely, you know, lovely. And, and I think Dennis was a bit surprised when we ran away with the league, you know. And yeah. uh, But there was always that thought we'd never lose. Just never lose. And then if somebody got injured, somebody else came in and just done done it for us, you know. So I think I played some like 55 games. I missed the last game because I, I, I took a booking in my second last game. Um lad was going through and I thought I'm bringing them down. You know, and we got a one one that day. Um and then uh, I missed the last game. <laughs> so but it was worth it. It was actually worth it. But uh, yeah, it, it was all the other clubs that had Chris, it was fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, just just because I mean, some of the listeners might be, uh, you know, jumping on Wikipedia and trying to look at the seasons. I mean, I was just, I was just going to think, you know, your first season you just missed out of promotion. Second season, like you say, running away with it, you were actually the first team in history in the football league to get over a hundred points, which is always yeah. going to be the answer. Always going to be the answer to a fantastic quiz question. Um, you know, along the down the years, but uh, but like you say, I mean, you you've rattled off so many names there: Roger Jones, Martin Crosby, Viv Busby, oh. John Byrne, John McPhail, Alan Hay. But all you know, all those names that you rattled off are all people who went on to either work for or play for Dennis Smith later on. I mean, I mean, you talked about that, you know, that that atmosphere, and obviously winning games does that. But it's incredible how many how many of those squad members went on to work with Dennis Smith further down the line. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dennis knew that all their um, all their antiques were up to and all that, but it, it, they, they were exceptionally good players. I mean, John Byrne for me was, you know, uh, he'd been to York. I can remember getting in the first year and he was he was worried he might get a free transfer. And I think Dennis reassured him, says, don't be so silly. You're one of my main men. You know, and he was, you know, for goals and things like that and his ability and Used to give you a little smile. They liked a few, couple of beers after. We, we always after the game went for a couple of beers. All the families would mix all you know things. It was different, different age group from twenty six to maybe Roger was fifty. Well, he, he didn't say he was fifty. He was probably about thirty. <laughs> Roger thirty five. But, <laughs> uh, but we all mixed. Then got to know their wives and all that, you know. And um, but the bond was there. And, and Dennis, we'd only something like eighteen players. I think it was something like that. We didn't get a lot of injuries and. You know, we just we just said this. We we knew anything up front would score goals for us, and we knew at the back with Roger at the time that uh, we would hardly concede. 
we just didn't give in much away. And Mike, Mike was a good player. John Mike was a good player. And, you know, where I used to talk to John quite a bit, you know, just to guide him into positions. You know, just but yeah. uh, then Alan here was left peg on. But, but it was like it got to a stage where we, we never ever thought we'd lose, and that was probably after eight games, ten games, because of what happened the following year, and there wasn't a lot of changes. Well, that's it. When you went up to Division Three, um, you you were actually pushing for promotion in Division Three as well, which was incredible at the time, but. It was it was the FA Cup where the the kind of big headlines came, um, nineteen eighty four eighty five um, fourth round you beat Arsenal one nil I think you might have beat Walsall in the third round but if that wasn't yeah. enough in the fifth round you drew well clearly you know nineteen eighty four yeah. nineteen eighty five that you know that Liverpool team were were unbelievable and they came to York and you managed a one one draw where you came from behind um, Ricky Sprazier. <laughs> scored, the, scored the equal, yeah, scored the equaliser and forced the replay. But you, you don't see enough because I, I was watching all the highlights of that game early, and you don't see enough of these sort of cup games in the modern game. But I mean, that that must have been one that was just incredible to be part of. Yeah, I, I think um, everything about it—that you know, the weather before the week, the game, and and the fans obviously putting a straw on the, the pitch. And <laughs> and then Dennis, to be honest, I can remember that week, we didn't really speak about Liverpool. It was mainly about us. How could we cope with it? We knew they'd world-class players. We knew they were exceptional, the best, probably best in Britain at that time. And But we we, we just got on. We had a plan, which we played every game. And um, we were fortunate. I think, we, I think Sean Hazelwave and, and Marley Crosby just sat in front of us. And they did protect us from deletion and, and, and rush. You know, and um, mm. but they did they, so many great players. But the weather, the pitch itself benefited us because of uh, it was a little bit hard. Uh, and it's the first time, Chris, I'll be honest, with you, I wore leather studs. You know, it was the very first time we, we wore leather studs. We were told to wear them because the, the, the pin and the stud gripped the, the ground better than mm-hmm. uh, aluminium studs, which were really slippy. Um, and then they went one up and uh, go back to one one. And um, I was just fortunate. I was the right place at the right time. The first one I shot, I, I hit the bar. I think Keith hit the bar with head of Keith Wall, and then yeah. I think Monty had one off the line and just rebound for me. And I just pulled. I never slowed my left peg, but I just thought I'll poke it, <laughs> have a look at it. But yeah, I was fortunate. I just been at the right place at the right time, scoring the goal, and you know, just you know, everything about it, the atmosphere. I mean, we get hit with a bottle. I can remember a Guinness bottle getting hit with a Guinness bottle. Uh, as we were all crowding in the six yard line, which we should never have done. That was a lot of plenty. But um, it was just it was just phenomenal. It was just great. And then on the Sunday, I met Ian Rush on the Sunday. Um, they asked him for a photo, so I, and I met him, and he, he was absolutely fantastic. Really great. And we knew, we knew when we were going to Anfield, it was going to be completely different. We knew that, you know. And um, But on the night, we, um, we did celebrate. We did have a few beers as a team. And enjoyed it, enjoyed it because it might never happen again. That you know, so why not enjoy it at that time? Yeah. And we did that, and uh, we're back in on Monday. And I think we played Liverpool on the Tuesday or Wednesday. It was that week, and, and lost seven 0 <laughs> So it was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was an experience. But no, everything was great. The crowd were great. The, the dressing room um, after the game was fantastic. You know, and but the, the, the gelling of it was always there. There was a belief. You know, we. That we we'd give people a good game, you know. We'd give them. We'd always. We'd never pack in, and we had big hearts, and we were very honest, you know. And we we uh, we achieved what we wanted to do. We'd love to have beat Liverpool, but we, we achieved to go back there and get get the the club more money to invest in players, you know, and and obviously do the the stadium up as well. And so we we achieved that. Yeah. I think I got ten yeah. pound. I think we got a ten pound uh, bonus. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was worth it, but there again, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so it was, it was fantastic. And then obviously, you know, you, it's living else. You know, people say, "Oh, I'm Ricky Spurs just done." But at the end of the day, it was it was all it was all it got the draw. It was every one of yeah. us and a belief that we could get something from the game. I did wonder because, I, I, like I said, I watched the highlights and and all throughout the highlights. Actually, I mean, I, I remember he had a fantastic game um, against Sunderland, but um, Keith Wall wouldn't. 
was a real <laughs> handful for for Liverpool that day. He was he was fantastic. But I was going to say, did, did he say anything? Because you just pipped him to 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 poke in the ball home when when you actually scored. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think it's just like you don't actually you score and you think, what do I do? I'll have a run to the left, <laughs> being like a monk, and then get hit with a bottle off of Liverpool. So no, I think when Monty came over and the Sean and the old crowd up, it was just I think it was a relief to get back into the game with the belief that. Hmm. Anything could happen with us. We we yeah. could have won it. You know, it was a chance we could win it. But we could have lost the game as well. But um I sure I've watched it a couple of times. I've got a nice photo somewhere in the attic <laughs> and me striking the ball. Um and I think I scored 17 goals in my career. I think it was it wasn't many, but that was to be to any doubt, that was the most important one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, yeah, and, and then as you say, you, you go on. I mean, look, York are impressing in the third division. And then in, in your, um, in your well, I think it was your final season as a player at the beginning of the season when Sunderland, um, they, they dropped down and, and we drew, actually, we, we were in the second division and Laurie McMenemy was managing. We drew York yeah, City in the course. first round of the League league Cup and you you were part, part of the York side that won 4-2 at Roker Park. And I mentioned I mentioned Keith Walwyn and Keith Walwyn took us apart that night and there was there was just over 9,000 there. But what were your memories of, of playing at Roker Park that night? Well, I, I'd never, ever played at Roker Park and it's steeped in history, you know, and mm. it was just absolutely fantastic. You know, on his day, Keith could be a, was a world beater, Keith, mm. you know. But, you know, when you go there and you, 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 they all stand out in the middle and you have a little chat and you have a look around and it's really just to get the dressing room ready for you know mm. the strips and get the boots out and all that and you have a little chat and you look at it and think my god there's some history here you know with the banks up you know the supporters are going to be there and they're very passionate the Sunderland people and but they just couldn't deal with Keith that day you know and that that surprised me a little bit Chris because I thought Dennis would have bought Keith Houchin because of what he did for him you know over the, mm. the three or four years and and still mm. could do that uh, but when you get players like John and that up there as well, and technically we were decent, you know, we weren't these one of these teams that just like Cambridge hit the corners, it's very sandy, the ball on no bounds, and let's get a long throw and go from there. We we played and we played down the side of people, and um, well, the atmosphere was great. If you said to me, we did came away with a win, and we were talking about a draw, mm-hmm. you know, it'd be nice to get a draw and bring them back to our place, you know, and win there, but. I think on the night everything went well for us and, and we played above our own standards, but we were exceptional, really exceptional. And, and Wall and Big Keith was out of this world. Yeah. Yeah, he was he was fantastic, and and actually that night we mentioned him early on, but a young Marco Gabadini came on a substitute that night. I think he was I think he was only eighteen or something like that, and obviously Dennis took him to 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 Sunderland. But I mean, he was pretty raw even when he came to Sunderland. But did you see it, that it was obvious he had potential at that stage? Yeah, he, he was ex- he could score goals, which was a massive plus, and and it was a bit of arrogance about Marco, but it was a nice mm-hmm. arrogance. You know, he would listen. He was very highly educated as well. You wouldn't think that, but he was. <laughs> he was, but uh, <laughs> just, just how he played and all that. And um, it never got to him. It didn't worry him at all about coming on or anything like that, you know, because it, 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 it total belief in what he could do. And, um, you know, I, I think for me, that Eric Gates, I'm going to just jump in a wee bit here, but Eric Gates made Marco Gavardin. You know, because of his position, though, and he probably talked to Marco about playing off him and running off him, but there was always potential. And then Christian and, uh, would have been there at the time. And we, we were taking Ricardo in as well. We could always similar. You know, so mm. maybe Marco had a little bit more noose about the, the, the way he played and uh, believed a little bit more in what he had. You know, and he wasn't following anybody where Ricardo would, you know, we say Ricardo, people talk about Marco, but Ricardo was, was decent as well, was an exceptional good player. I think it was the, the season after the 1987, I think, when you when you kind of hung up your playing boots, but uh, it, it was around the same time that Dennis Smith left to, to take the Sunderland job. And he was replaced by Bobby Saxon, and obviously yeah. you had that you had that role under Dennis Smith. I mean, was there a, was it a concern that it wouldn't continue under Bobby Saxon? Was there a conversation there that you know you had to have with Bobby Saxon to to continue? Yeah, I, th- I think what happened. I think Dennis, more than likely, Dennis had probably thought he you know he'd done enough for the club. He couldn't really go any further. And and mm. when when a club like Sunderland call, you can't refuse them. 
he just can't refuse them. And um, and possibly I, th- I was thinking that maybe the game we played in the League Cup maybe yeah. got him the job as well. You know, they've seen that and seen what he's got, and they're not big names. We did no big names, and, and we beat Sunderland in the end. But um, um, I think I think the big concern was that it was breaking up. Things were breaking up. Players were wanting to leave. Like Bernie was wanting to leave. Ford they went to Leicester. The contracts were up, and uh, I think they wanted to go outside and see what it was like. You know, get away from home and um, and test ourselves again. And um, but then the mass ed- ed- uh, exodus happened. With, you know, uh, Viv left, and then uh, Roger went, and then Maori went, and um, then the players went. And yeah, you can understand that. You can understand a lot, probably chairman at the time. I mean, I've not enjoyed it, but I mean, that's football. That's how it is. I mean, because there'll be times in your life where the chairman makes a decision he doesn't want, he lets you go, you know, and um, mm. so it works the other way as well. But I thought they went up there and I thought they were the right people to do that. And the good thing about them was that they were all very close to each other and they all, although they had opinions, they all would back Dennis, which mm. you need. You know, you just need that. You need somebody, you, may, you want to have an opinion. You might disagree mm. with them, but at the end of the day, the manager makes that final decision and then you stay by that. I don't moan about it after, you know. You have your opinion there, but I think Sunderland did really well to get them on. Yeah, because it, it wasn't the done thing then to take a management team, was it really? It was... No. No, not, and, and I think, I'm, I'm sure because we've, we've done we've done an interview with, um, uh, with, with Dennis Smith and he was talking about you know, you know, Bob Murray not wanting to pay compensation to York for Dennis Smith, and then not wanting to pay compensation for the coaching staff as well. So it was a, it was kind of a leap of faith almost to take a management team because that that was pretty rare back then. Yeah, and, and, and I think as I said earlier, I think Dennis could trust what he had. He, he knew them all. He knew how hard they worked, and uh, they were very dedicated. And I think sometimes you bring somebody in, uh, it could be a little bit difficult. For you, you don't know what he's thinking, you don't know what he's saying, and what his thoughts are. And mm. Is he whispering somewhere else? So you're probably better bringing people in, you know, and you know, you didn't bring them in for the sake of you bring them in, you bring them in because you know they're all good, they all mm. work hard and genuine, you know. And I think Dennis, and that's what York City had when his coaching staff was there. And I think Marley, I might be wrong, did Marley go to Kuwait in '86? Yeah, I think he went to Kuwait, he, he, he left, yeah. For it. yeah. A year earlier, wasn't but it? They, they were they were all great, and I was pleased from you know. I sometimes wonder why she didn't take me. <laughs> but, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> well, I was just about to say that you continued with with Bobby Saxon, which must have been another part of your education because you were still quite a young coach at that. Yeah, point. Bob Bobby came in the first day, and there was a lot left, you know. And mm. he came in, he asked to see me. I went in another chat. He said, "Oh, we'll do this and do that." And I'll speak to you after. So yeah, no problem. He said, "Well." We'll get them all together and um, he says then um, we'll probably have some of the tennis side just have a look at them. And I think there was five pros at the time. I said, you've only got five players. The rest are just kids. The rest are just scholars we've just brought in and, you know, and they, they, they may have been at that time, they may have been Chris Tate who came to Sunderland and Jonathan Greeny was coming through and Murti was comes a few, they were maybe a little bit earlier, but Bobby, Bobby had a big steal and borrow um, on trying to bring players in and, and go on other people's opinions. Which, he just didn't have the time. I think that was the main thing. He had to get a team. He had to get a team of players before the season started. And he only had five. And he tried his socks off, honestly. He worked hard. He was phoning people up and it was good to me I had no complaints at all you know and because um, it is difficult because when somebody comes in they want to change it all you know and um, I just joined but uh, he was brilliant Bob and I did feel really sorry for him because what all the better players you would say all the big players had gone you know I think mm-hmm. Keith John, gone Bernie had gone um, Monty Allen you know they'd all gone there were about seven or eight of them had gone you know, and some of the contracts, pre- the other ones that maybe didn't get contracts. So it was it was a really precarious time for Cycle. And he, for me, he tried his hardest. And unfortunately, um, the quality from what people were used to seeing wasn't there. I think that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, like you said, all of those players left and the majority of them went to went to Sunderland, actually. But yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't until about, um, it was about seven years later um, that you ended up being appointed as youth team coach and Dennis Smith had long gone at Sunderland by this point. Um we were under Mick Buxton in nineteen ninety four. Um yeah. and you kinda of took took it on for a 
well, from a kind of couple of institutions, really, and Jimmy Montgomery and George Hurd, who'd done it for quite a few years before that. And it was a strange time just after the 94-95 season had started. It kind of got underway. Um, so, so how did that job offer come about? And kind of, was it was it a no-brainer at that point? Because you, you'd been at York for, you know, probably, what, about a decade by that point? Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think the main thing, Chris, was that, you know, sometimes you're at a club, you have become part of the furniture. You're just there, mm. you know. And, and, and we brought some really good players. Richard Creswell through the sold. Uh, Nick Culkin went to my United at 1.6. Greeny went to my United at 1.6. Murty went to Reading for three quarters. Quarters a million. And then uh, I hadn't signed a contract for five years. You know, I just hadn't signed a contract. And, you know, and I thought, you know, and the final year we were top of the Northern Indians because, you know, these players had played and were winning everything. Darren Williams, there was another prime example, a player we brought in from Mask. And, um, you know, you, you you know, you go there and then I, I came in on a Friday. We were playing Holloway in the Saturday, if you remember, and, and Douglas Craig, it changed completely where Michael Sinclair was, was for me, was a fantastic chairman. Douglas Craig came in. Uh, but I don't think he was aware of what we did or what the people that worked for us for nothing did. I don't think he knew that. And then, so I, I came in after training. It was about half past one. He, he, he pulled me in the, chair, uh, the secretary's office with Keith and he said to me, uh, just to let you know, um, there's been a little bit of interest from Sunderland for you. I says, all right, okay then. Um, but he says, he says um, I've told him you're happy here. Uh, I says, oh, hold, hold that minute here. Hold that minute. What do you mean I'm happy here? I says, you haven't offered me a contract in seven years. Um, and you're now making a decision for me to say I'm happy and I've signed a contract. So I'm not signed a contract. Never ever signed a contract here. So I says, uh, he says, well, I've told them you're not interested. I said, well, let me think about it. So we went to Albion M4, came back on the Monday, I went in to see him. And um, I said, I'd like to talk to someone. I'd like to talk to Mickey Boxton. You know, I think it's a, another step in the direction I want to go to. And uh, to be fair to Mick, he phoned me up on the Monday and I think he invited me to a Central League game. It was at Roker and it was, uh, I'm sure it was Liverpool. And it was like six o'clock at night, you know, sort of. Oh, so I got to there and I met him in the boardroom at Roker, walked up the stairs and bent round to the right. And he uh, got talking about his insoles, these Japanese magnetic <laughs> insoles. <laughs> I'm not thinking to myself, I've got a loony here. You know, he's I want to talk about football and all that. He's thought, oh, they're fantastic. I've got a bit of gout and they're great for me and all that. Right. You know, and um, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take you to Charlie Hurley Centre, the training grounds. So I went, yeah, okay. Okay, we got there. It was pitch black. I, I, I saw the gate. seen the gate. And they said to me, there's where we train. Well, I couldn't see any pitches. I couldn't see at all. We couldn't get access into the training ground. I thought, oh my God. So came home. Um he phoned me on the uh, the Wednesday. I watched the game, finished watching the game, went home and um, said, Look, this is what we're off you. Uh were you interested? I said, Yeah, I'll come. You know, I'll come. Um you need to speak to Douglas Craig, give him courtesy. And um so Douglas brought me in the following day and um offered me a bigger pay rise, which I said to him was too late. And I uh, wanted to go to, to Sunderland. I'd made up my mind. You know, I thought I'd done my, my time there. And when I spoke to Dennis and Viv and all them, they, they said what a lovely place it was, you know, to work, you know, and the fans were great and the people in general were great and the staff were great. And it proved they were. But the problem, the biggest problem I had was uh, when Mick left, Peter Reid came in. Yeah. And this was in the summer. And I'm thinking, my God, I've just came here, you know, and as a new manager, God, what's going to happen? <laughs> you know, basically, you didn't worry about that. Yeah. And to be fair to Bobby, Bobby Saxton came. And I don't know if it was the same day, maybe in a couple of days, Bobby came in and they pulled me and he said to me, Ricky, I went, yeah, Bobby, he said, you're okay, don't worry about it. And that was it. Yeah. You know, and um, I worked with, with Monty and I worked with George Heard and, you know, they were, they were lovely people. You know, they, they were something through and through, especially Monty. You know, Monty, a lot of time for Monty and George. You know, George was a wee bit maybe old school in the sense, mm-hmm. but Monty definitely had the club at heart and loved the club. And he was he's a legend. Monty's a legend, you know. And, and I learned from them as well. What what I had to do, which I didn't realise, I did do the YT books because they hadn't done them for six months. So I had to, <laughs> to fill all these YT books up, get them all up to date for us to get placements. Yeah. So I thought, God, if you've been landed into this one, but uh, yeah, it, it was really good. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And 
Peter Reid was, was was very good, and then Brace was excellent. Brace mm-hmm. looked after the players and the coach, the coaches. You know, he done whatever he could for you. If you had a problem, you really didn't have a problem. You know, and um, and and just things like that. And Paul Paul Brace will speak at a high level, and so is Peter Reid. And and Saka was is probably one of the best coaches I, I've ever seen working. To be honest mm-hmm. with you. Yeah, you know, for working behind the scenes, a complete legend at Sunderland. But, but actually, it's funny because we we talked to you know some players about coming through at Sunderland about that time of you know we talked to people like Martin Smith and you know people like that Darren Holloway and they, they all talk about Jimmy Montgomery and George Hurd. You know that at that point being really tough to come through. It was kind of yeah, they were t- really tough coaches. But uh, but like you said, I mean, Peter Reid came in completely changed. Just kind of it, it, it almost just kind of just his presence kind of lifted the club up. But I imagine from, from your point of view, you, you know, after being given the nod to say, yep, you know, keep doing what you're doing or whatever. But I imagine it still took, um, you know, kind of a new management team, you know, Peter Reid, a while to sort out a new outlook and, and kind of strategy for a youth system at Sunderland. So were you just given a free license to, to, to crack on with it? Uh, or did they kind of sit down with you? Because it, it, they had seven games and that was the first summer. So did he already have something in mind for how we wanted to do things or did you just kind of crack on with it? I just cried. What, what we did on the, the pre-season, we all joined together on the pre-season. We did this sort of 10 by 10 and sometimes 20 by 20 boxes. And it was all fun and games, you know, which was a bit different, you know, and uh, they did the running and all that. But uh, Sacco said, and so, so did Reedy said it, um, make it enjoyable, make sure that every day is different. You know, so Tuesday's not a running day. It might be something else. They're expecting a running day, but change it, you know, and yeah. make it interesting and get this thing about, the same as my United was when I went to my United, I was told that just make sure they come in and they want to enjoy what they do and, and let them let them show what they've got, let them show the ability they've got. And really would come to the game. Sacco would be a little bit more constructive uh, with me, you know, maybe pull me aside and he'd ask about the players and how they're doing and, and I think really his thoughts were really mainly on the first team, you know, getting that going. And um, yeah, for, for me, they, they let me go on with it, you know, in a sense. And then uh, they'd ask for players. They said to me, same as Sir Alex Ferguson asked me, if they wanted a player over, which player deserved to go over? You know, not what you probably find is that uh, a manager will shout, Ricky, bring so and so over. And you think, God, he's been crap all week. He shouldn't go over. Well, they said to me, bring a player over that deserves to be over. For me, Sackle would, you know, was very interested in Peter. Uh, obviously, had the interest, but his main thoughts were towards the first team. Yeah, and and it wasn't long after that summer. I think it was the, maybe a year later or so when um, Pop Robson was brought in as as director yeah. of youth. I mean, he he's always had a he's had a fantastic reputation as a as a coach. You know, he was at Leeds. I think he was at Manchester United as well. I mean, so was was that kind of a, a big step when Sunderland brought him in as as director of youth as well? Yeah, Pop, Pop was a gentleman, really good coach and lovely man, and spent time and you know obviously he had a happy feeling about him. Uh, and he brought in Jim Hagen, one of the scouts from my United, who, who was fantastic as well. And I think eventually he brought in Jed McNamee uh, yeah. as one of the sort of academy coaches. Uh, but um, no, Pop, Pop was good. We, we had a good chat. I knew Pop. I actually sort of met, knew Pop uh, through the circuit. I'd met him and I'd spoken to him. And he's a legend again. He's a legend, Pop. Um, mm. But a very quiet man. Gets on with a job, you know, and, and lets him deal with it. You know, but um, then they mapped out the scouting, what we needed to do. And we used to go together, you know, the three of us, it was me, Jim and Pop, at the time we'd go and watch games in Ireland and, and things like that. Um, mm. But Pop had ideas he was bringing in from, from Manchester United as well, you know, about the, the technical side and the ball side and, you know, and uh, focusing a lot on their weaknesses. You know, like Kevin Kyle, I remember Kevin being there, we did a lot of footwork with Kevin. He was like Herman Munster when he came, but um, <laughs> he, uh, he was, he, he was awful. But we used to put a, a, a rapid foot movement for him up at the top, and new ideas. So, you know, it did work for us. Yeah, and, and it was it was funny, I was looking back, and it's funny because during the Dennis Smith years, the, this whole kind of list of players came through um, the ranks, you know, going back to kind of Kieran Brady and David Rush and, you know, Brian Atkinson, whole host of players came through under Dennis Smith. And then then there was a couple of, you know, two or three years where it, it was quite, you know, it was only 
Yeah, Michael Gray came through. Martin Smith. I mean, fantastic players, but yeah, we didn't have we didn't have the numbers that we had during Dennis Smith's years. And then suddenly, it, it kind of popped up again around the time when Peter Reid came in because in his first season, Sam Easton broke through. Darren Holloway got a chance. Michael Bridges, obviously, you know, made that <laughs> unbelievable breakthrough. I mean, did you yeah. see straight away that we had a few that had a chance? Yeah, I think they were given the opportunity. You know, and then and what they did, and, and again, like I said, two of them, Peter and um, Sacco, was that they picked the right time from to go in to the squad. And they, they probably trained with the first team as well quite a bit, which, which, you know, don't get as nervous. And one of the, you know, one of the things, like, this is a big Man United thing, that, you know, the manager used to say to you, um, you know, which player should go over? He's, he's coming over for two weeks. So he go over for two weeks. So Bobby would say he's going over for two weeks. And let's see how he deals with it when he comes back. If he's barely big time and he's beyond us now and, and how he deals with it. And then we'd speak to him before he went, you're going for two weeks and then he's he's going to test you. You know, you're going to play in the reserves, you know, and things like that. I just think everything, you know, about it was... was and, it, and to be fair, Chris, he, he probably got the back in the club as well. You know, he, from the chairman and all that, you bring in a new manager, a new staff and all that, and you, you've got to back him. And then on the youth side, you know, Darren came and, and Bridges was a fantastic get from us, you know, because uh, I've actually got a photo on my Instagram account where we signed his first contract, you know, and he's as young as anything, you know, and uh, what a player, what an exceptionally good player. Maybe sometimes names bring people to the club, especially the management side, you know, Peter Reid and, and maybe Sacco, and then there was obviously Pop as well, Pop Robson. That sometimes brings people to the club. Yeah. I mean, just on the subject, just quickly about Bridges, you said, you know, fantastic signing. But I mean, when he, when he first came on, you, there, was, there was this little bit of a buzz around him. And I remember seeing him when he first came on as sub and you saw him and you, th- you thought, blimey, you know, he's kind of six stone wet through. Um, <laughs> but I mean, he, he, the, the, I mean, the management team, the, the likes of yourself must have just seen straight away what a talent he was to throw him in. When he he looked when he, if you just looked at him he looked like he couldn't handle first team football you know imagine a big centre half coming through the back of him but I mean God he, he didn't half have the talent to, to kind of you know <laughs> to yeah. turn up and, it, and grab a goal yeah he was definitely lightweight and then obviously we're doing some work on that but what Bridges had is he'd really good intelligence on if you look top as a football player it gave you three options. Some would only give you one option, mm. you know, and you might get a, a second one, but you wouldn't. Bridges would give you three options. They'd go away, come down short, he'd come off at an angle, you know, and things like that. And he, he would take the ball with people behind him, but he was clever enough to shift it. He knew when that ball came, he knew roughly what he was going to do with it, you know, and he'd always, we'd just say to him, try and play the opposite the defender wants you to do. So he might want you to shoot it in the line, go the other way. You know, always do the opposites, you know, if you can. If he shows you line, you're clever, then, then do it. But his touch was his touch was fantastic, and then he, he, he just had a knack for scoring again, which for forward is out of this world. And Marco had that, but it's just that bravery back to goal when when people are there. He's still prepared to take it, you know. And but he knows what he's going to do before he re- he receives it. And I think the saw. I can't remember what he sold him, but from my point of view, he, he, we'd won. I think we'd won argument. I can remember not being happy with him. We went to Doncaster in the Northern Intermediates and it was him and Darren Holloway and they were, they were poor, were really, really poor and I can't remember the score and I gave him a blast and I said to him that, you know, I don't think, you know, that you're going to go in the first team and train with them and I'm going to have my say and all that about that. Mm. And Sod's Law got a phone call about 20 minutes later from Peter Reid saying, can we get Darren Holloway <laughs> Michael Bridges to meet us at I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> I thought, oh no, you know, I'm telling the other players, you know, you've got to do the business, man. These two have just absolutely mucked around today, done so at all. And you always expect, but I suppose that happens. They can't produce the goods. But I thought, it's this to, uh, I think who I was with, maybe in Paul. I thought, oh God, Paul, what, what have I done? This is all happened, more. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I get my right roasting. I was in the dressing room looking at me, and then about 20 minutes later, I'll be with the first team. <laughs> <laughs> oh well it's life isn't it I thought well I'll uh, have a go on Monday <laughs> well you can you can pitch it as uh, some uh, fantastic reverse psychology there you know oh god oh. <laughs> oh, yes. but um, 
But I mean, after after that, I mean, you know, Peter E, you know, we got relegated, obviously, but we the club really just kind of went str- from strength to strength. You know, we just kind of took off. Um, Peter Reid was kind of bringing, um, you know, the 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 transfer record would seem to be going year after year. Um, but at this at the same time, you know that you know that first season, those young players came through. We had a small squad. We needed that kind of additional help from the young players. But after that. You know, when you start bringing those players in and then you've got mm. players knocking on the door like, you know, Paul Thurwell was for a few years. We had, you know, I can rattle them off, Chris Lumsden, Mark Mealy, Thomas Butler, George McCartney, Michael Procter. You were bringing all these players through, but when the club's doing well, those chances become kind of more limited. It, it's, how difficult does that make your job when there's fewer opportunities for young players in terms of keeping them motivated and, and keeping them at the club as well? I think it is difficult. You, you, you try to keep them there up at the top in a good physical condition and um, having that belief the door open again. I think that's a big thing. But I think with the players, we spoke to them and um, and said to them, your chance will come, but you have to. Be, at that time you have to be ready for it. You know, and uh, that means you have to train well, you have to play games. The, the great thing, and, and again, Pop brought this in, was the loan system. You know, the loan system, the sense that we had to get players to play higher in the, the Central League at the time. You know, mm-hmm. so they had to go out and loan. But one of the stipulations we, what we should have put in is that they had to play the games. With a lot of the clubs, have, bigger clubs have been there tend to say, OK, you can take so and so, but you've got to play them. You know, you've got to play them in the 90 minutes, you've got to play them in 75. And, they watched them. In my age, we used to watch 19 players. We'd watch them all, see how they're doing. But, you know, they go away and, and, and but you probably find sometimes they get dropped or they're not quite ready for it. Well, you took them in loan. You took them in loan to play them, not to sit on the bench or to have another number. So we had to make sure that uh, when we did send them in loan after maybe a year or so that um, they were going to play football to benefit them, you know, to get them a career in football. You know, I would think... Sometimes you go to reserve games, it's a social thing for uh, scouts to have a chat with each other. How have you been? What have you done? They're not really watched again. You know, and, um, you know, see, so you, you happen to say to them, like, go alone. It's a great little move. You thoroughly enjoy it, you know, and if anything. And some of them, you'd see some of them, they'd into Peter Reed's room and they'd say to me, uh, what's the one? I said, I think it's about sending you out alone. I'm not going alone. I said, you will be. Don't you worry about that. You will be going out alone. <laughs> Five minutes later, I went, where are you going? Where are you going? Yeah, I'm going to the right, OK. I said, it's great for you. It'll be great for you. And it'll play in a good standard of football. But I said, what we'll do to you is when people look at your record, they'll give you games. I played 40 games for so-and-so or 30 games for so-and-so. So you've got yeah. you've got experience. Where someone will say, what experience has got? He's played 30 games for the reserve game. Yeah, but I mean, what experience has got? He hasn't got any uh, uh, full league. You know, so uh, that side of it comes into it. But it's... Some of them, you, you have to say to them, you know, when you go to a club, stay at the club. Although you're a Sunday player, you're not really a Sunday player. You say it was Hull. We, we, we've done a deal with Hull in York City with Michael Proctor. Okay. Michael went to York. Um, mm. Okay, you go there, you train every day. You don't come back and train here because you, you, you're at your loan club, you know, and give it everything you get. And then we'll follow you, we'll speak to you. We'll get in touch with you, see how things are, and how's your digs and things like that. So they're, they're, they're okay that way. Yeah, and, and I mean, and then a few years later, I mean, you you make the step up to to, to taking the reserve team, and it's amazing to say now, and probably you know, younger fans might not not quite believe us when we say that for reserve games at the stadium, like we were getting thirty thousand for reserve games um, during that that kind <laughs> yeah. of period. I mean, the, the club was just unbelievable. It was only going in one direction. It was an amazing time to be a, a Sunderland fan, but it looked, you know, under under kind of Peter Reid and Bobby Saxon, it just looked. Like everyone was in it together. Um, I mean, was it just a great time to be involved in the club, working behind the scenes? Because uh, we had some great characters at the club throughout that whole period as well. Oh, you don't have to tell me. I know that. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I can remember the reserve team. I think it was Alex Ray and Nicky Summerby was playing and uh, John Mullen maybe at the time. And, and uh, to drive them on, you know, because they weren't happy about the, about the first team. You know, and I can remember Nicky Sowerby coming on a Saturday morning. He used to say to me every Saturday morning, he says, Ricky, uh, no, sorry, Friday. He says, I won't be in tomorrow. I said, oh, why is that, Nicky? Um, I've got a funeral. This was the first time I went, yeah, OK, no problem at all. You know, and we went, who's in tomorrow? And I said, oh, Nicky's not here, he's, he's at a funeral. He went, oh, OK, that's fine. And then next Saturday, he came and said it again. 
I gave him the benefit of doubt. And then the third Saturday came again. I thought, all right, okay. Now. I said, I'm going to tell you something, Nicky. I said, I'd be hating to be related to you the way things are going in your side of the family. <laughs> so, but to be fair to him, I used to say to him, look, you know, come and train. Do a wee bit extra Friday. Train Friday. I'll give you a wee bit extra, a wee bit of running, a wee bit of the ball work and all that. You can have Saturday off. You know, I don't mind that, you know, because you're a senior player and I have to trust you. Alex would be the same. But no, it's, Alex would come in. But you, you just didn't know what Alex Ray's temper would be. You know, how he was and how he was fixed. And I think, oh, God. But I used to say to him before the game, you used to be morning, I should be in the first team, I should be doing this. And I said, okay, then I said, look, I used to put, get a sheet of paper and I said to him, look, there you go. All these ones are not happy. There's 30 scouts watching you tonight. So you've got a choice. Either go, muck around, they don't bother you. Or... If you want to move, you've got a great chance of getting the move if you do the business tonight. And, and to be fair to him, Chris did. He had no complaints. But, the, you know, some days you'd come in and they weren't well for training. I'd have to say to him, go in and get yourself injured. You pulled your hamstrings. So I'd bring him out, train him for a couple and say, go and see the physios and just see your, your thighs tight. So just little things like that. But, you know, they, they were good. They were really good. And then I, I helped him as much as I physically had because, because at the end of the day, they're senior players and, yeah. You know, and uh, they look at the first team and think I should be playing the first team, and there's probably somebody in there better than them. But uh, there was some odd and, and strange things we had to do with them to to pacify them. But in general, they were really good. Yeah, I was, I was going to say because you you done all that with the kind of young players, and you can obviously see young players develop and all this sort of stuff. Was was that was that a step you wanted to take with the reserve team? Because it, it sounds like more kind of kind of man management kind of aggravation rather than development players. Yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a form of development, I said, with the sense that possibly I, I would know what's coming through the youth side. And it, there's a different way to treat a young player to, to way to treat a senior pro, you know. You can say a senior, a senior pro and you say to him, look, maybe consider doing this. Don't say, I want you to do that because they chew my mm-hmm. head off. They tell me to go and get it. I've won so many medals. So I try to do <laughs> yeah. that way and, <laughs> but most of them were decent. I, I didn't have any. I had a bit of laugh, a bit of banter with them, and know. And uh, but I, I got to know them because previously they were mainly always with the first team. And Bobby would say, "Look, you've got five. Go to play the reserves on uh, Monday or Thursday." And I said, "Oh yeah, that's fine, Bob. But you're going to stop the progress that these five young boys were playing." Uh, so what I'd say to the, the senior players, I said, I said, go out there. And I know you're not happy being here. I know that. I know when Bobby turns around and says, you five are playing tonight, you're not happy. I know that. But what you have to remind, you're stopping somebody else's career by taking their position tonight. And then, so go and do the business. Then get yourself in the first team. Then I can bring this young player. And the young player can see how professional you are and your mannerism and how disciplined you are. And, and they were, to be honest with you. And so there was, that, there was that side as well. But it's that fear of progression that your reserves gets choked up with senior players, that you're, you're stopping maybe, you see, your Tommy Butlers, your Brendan McGills, your Kevin Kells, you're stopping all them coming up. And they're ready to come up. And the other ones are probably ready to go in the first team or leave, basically. You know, but no, I mean, I still keep in touch with Alex, who's fantastic. You know, I do, I do speak to Alex through Instagram and all that. And uh, he, he was great to be around. He was funny and great. And uh, he sometimes playing your sympathy a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> every time he played it, he did the business. I, I, that's yeah. what I can say. So yeah. it was that same bit. And, and and then in October two thousand and two, it kind of well it, it, after a year or so, you could see things were breaking up. And then and like I said, in October two thousand and two. Peter Reid was sacked and we appointed Howard Wilkinson. Uh, and then about a month later, um, if you thought managing the Sunderland reserve team was difficult, you get the job to take the Manchester United reserve team. Um, and they're at the height of their powers almost. You know, they won the Premier League seven out of their previous 10 seasons. It was only two years or three years, I think, after they completed the treble. Um, I can't imagine that was a difficult decision to make, especially because almost that golden period at Sunderland, it, it kind of come to an end at that point. Yeah, I mean, I was happy, uh, Chris, with, with um, Howard and um, Dave Codd. I was happy with it because yeah. they brought me more into the first team and I became sort of training with them. And um, we actually played Manchester United on the Thursday. And I was talking to Mick Phelan before the game and uh, he was just saying, I'm really tired and, you know, I'm doing a lot of jobs. And I said, well, what are you doing? And he said, um, well, I do the first team and I'm, I'm having to do the reserves because they're, they're trying to get a reserve coach in. 
So I went, all right. So and normally, <laughs> Chris, I don't I don't tend to phone people. You mm. know, I just think I'll, I'll send a CV in, and if I get it, I get it. If I don't, but I, I phoned a friend of mine's. And I says, look, it was Mick. Uh, I've known really well. I've known since uh, the early part, maybe 94. And I says to Mick, could you find out, uh, he was an agent. I said, could you find out if Man United are doing interviews for the, the, for the reserve team job? So he says, would you be interested? I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind you know, having a chat. So he came back next day and he says, uh, yeah, they're doing all, they've done three. And uh, you can have yours on Thursday. I went, oh, God. Yeah, I said, that'd be nice. He said, yeah, so Alex Ferguson will talk to you on the Thursday about it. So I got up at, oh God, I think it was half, half four in the morning. I didn't, I didn't meet him at half six at Carrington. But the strange thing was, we're off in the morning at Sunderland and training in the afternoon. Hmm. So um, when I spoke to him, I had about two hours with him. He knew everything about me, Chris. He knew everything about where I came from, my background, my family, <laughs> my career. Yeah. He mentioned Jonathan Greening. We mentioned Nick Culkin, who we sold for 3.2 million. Uh, we'd actually played Manchester United, was at York City in the FA Youth Cup. It may have been near enough the quarterfinals. They beat us 5 0 at Old Trafford mm. with all the big names. And, and he came and he, he says, well, well done. He says, We thought you'd decline and just kicked us. I just said, Well, no, I try and play football. Well, maybe not mm. technically as good as yours, but we, we do try, you know, to I thought of maybe taking them up another level. So I um, had my interview, uh, said to me, I've got one interview to do on the Friday, then I'll give you a phone. Well, we went to Liverpool, and I think we drew nil-nil. I, mean, I think we drew nil-nil at Liverpool. They had about 70 shots of goals or 60, and we had yeah. one. And we, it was backs against the wall. And I, kept, I was on the bus, I was pleased at this point. I couldn't get away with it. We think, God, I'm right. And, you know, we got away with it. And they deserved the players. They deserved the luck and all that. And then... Um, yeah. I was coming off at Billing, I got my car up and I got this call and it's a private number. I normally don't answer no call numbers or private numbers. I don't, I don't tend to do it. And I answered it and it was Sir Alex Ferguson. He says, the job's yours, I'll see you Tuesday. <laughs> All right. But I knew we were off Tuesday. I went, yeah, okay then. So on the Sunday, I phoned up my friend. I said, what did I ask for? He said, yes, he gave us all these figures. Mm, what did I ask for? And... Um, so I went on the Tuesday to see him again. It was early, it was about half six. Uh, didn't really actually discuss the contract. He just said to me, that was it. You know, there's your contract. Um, <laughs> there, there's what we pay. Here's the incentives, you, you know, and things like that. There was less of us on at Sunderland. So I thought, all right. <laughs> well. <laughs> and I says to him, is that negotiable? He went, no, I bloody ain't negotiable. I didn't say that. I said, oh. I went, I okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I'm driving back up. I'm up at first from Manchester. It must be something like half ten. I'm driving up there and <laughs> a phone call from their press at, at Sunderland to say, oh, hi, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, right. He says, uh, I see you've joined Man United. I says, what? I said, no, I haven't joined Man United. I says, oh, so it's very put in it. And the ability to say you're joining was a rare team coach. I thought, oh, God. I hadn't told her. <laughs> so... <laughs> I said, I'll be there in about an hour and a half. So I got there. I seen Howard. He was as good as gold. He says, yeah, I can understand. Not a problem. We'd like to keep you. Um, but um, I says, look, they, they say I've got to spend more time giving them more notice. He says, no, no, you can leave today. You take your stuff. You've done brilliant for us and brilliant for the club. And um, So that was it. You know, basically, that was it. And then so I phoned, I phoned uh, Sir Alex on the, the Tuesday. He said, everything's been done. The club have been fine and all that. No compensation, nothing at all. They were happy with that. And uh, he went, OK, I'll see you in a week's time. Have, have a week off. So I went, oh, OK. <laughs> so I had a week off. <laughs> had a week off. I didn't know what to do. We'd actually just had moved house. So I done that. And then uh, I went in and Brian McClay was there. Um, Jim Ryan. Brian McClay was fantastic. What a mentor for me he was. Uh, mm. And then I changed. My whole thought of football changed completely. How I seen myself, how I seen the players. You know, I can remember one afternoon we were doing set plays. He says, to, he says, look, they've got to be out every day. They go to college on a Monday, Monday afternoon out, Tuesday, two periods, Wednesday, the same, Thursday, the game at night, train them Thursday morning, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I went, OK, then. so we did all that. And I'm doing these set plays one day. And he came up, he, Brian came over, Brian McLean, and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing some set plays. He went, nah, 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 nah. He just said, we don't do set plays <laughs> here. I went, ah, OK, so what do we do? He said, we'll just get to Chris Eagles. He can do it all. Kieran Richardson or um, listen with Gerard Piquet at 16 uh, mm. on, on to Gerard Piquet and 
Giuseppe Rossi and Fraser Campbell and we had Johnny Evans and we had 31 pros they all signed professional they all made careers out of it but we, <laughs> Brian and I were in charge of elite players so they were anything from 16 to probably 19 Sylvan Blake Paul McShane funny enough mm. Paul McShane you know and uh, we gen- three centre backs were Paul McShane Jared Piquet and Johnny Evans so oh. I can remember Paul meant to say to you I can remember Paul coming to Sunderland and says Paul what makes you a better coach than me? You know, I says, how do you do it? He says, Ricky, you're only as good as the quality you're coaching. He said to me. Mm. That's what he said to me. Mm. He says, in my United, you've got quality. This is when he came into Sunderland. And it's always mm. stuck with me. And I went there and um, I lost my first seven games. I was the first coach ever in my United's history to lose the first seven reserve games. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I remembered from uh, the, the, the gaffer I've been mentioned to me a couple of times. <laughs> I tried to keep yeah. out his way. And we, he says, don't worry. He says, next year you've got a team. He says, you have got a team. And we did have a team. And, uh, you know, you think, God, I mean, but just everything about the place. It was so simple. There was nothing different, except they had quality players. But there was nothing different yeah. at all, Chris, at all with it. It was just football. We did do this special running, which wasn't great. They had, uh, wasn't as much as we'd probably do at Sunderland and all that. Everything was with the ball. It had to be in really tight areas it'd be quick sharp get your mind going two touch one touch and sometimes you could just leave them Chris and talk about something yeah. else and they'd just carry on <laughs> just carry on when Giuseppe Rossi was out of this world I mean he was yeah. out of this world and so was Jared Pique he liked to play a bit deep Jared but we pushed him up a little bit with Johnny Evans you think we two an open edge reserve team the two centre backs were 16, 17 you know and they handled it just handled it the team with you know Davy Jones who went to Burnley Tom Heaton was a keeper, you know, and you yeah. think, God almighty, you know, it just, just went on and on. It was like just another world you're in. You know, you just thought, God almighty, and they wanted to drain, they wanted to be the best. And then I remember the manager coming over and saying to me, Ricky, we need a couple of players for tomorrow. And the usual manager say, I want so-and-so and so-and-so. He'd go, I need a midfield player and a centre forward. Send me the ones that deserve to go over. So I'd say to him, he'd been over. And uh, that's the first time really... Bobby did that. Bobby Saxon did it. To emphasise even more, you know, uh, Sir Alex had done it and that was completely new. And he used to come up, he used to start, you'd, you'd be coaching or doing something. He used to just be there and you think, God, how's he got there? How's he seen it? And he said, well, it's gone well. You know, and he'd test you. He'd test you a lot of things. All the team played well. No, I don't think. Remember Brian McClare saying to me, um, he'll test you, Ricky. Oh, no, okay. and we're having lunch, uh, breakfast one day and he's sitting opposite and Brian's beside me. We played Walsall. We drew four four at Walsall. Uh, um, I think it was in January or February or something like that. But the first team were away to um, Fenerbahce, I think it was. So he took about nine of the the reserve team with them and played them. Mm-hmm. And then um, so I had I had like Phil Picking, who was my centre back, who was five foot five, and we we got in Ron Calis and you know and. Uh, they had Vassell playing and a couple of other big names, the, the German midfield player they had playing. And we got 4 4 at uh, Walsall, funny enough. The next day he says, uh, I thought Ramon Calise played well for you. And Chalky just kicked me. He just kicked me. <laughs> and I says, uh, and it just clicked into my head again. And I said, Yeah, he did okay, Gaff. I don't think it was the best. He went, Yeah, I don't think it was the best, but he did okay for you. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so. But he, he was fantastic because, you know, of all my career, he, he's the best I've ever worked under. Really, I mean that, the best ever to learn from. And Mick Feeling was there and he was different class as well. And Brian McClare was my mentor. He looked after me. And I think the following year, we took two teams, two teams in the Pontins and, and uh, we took two, two teams in the Barclays and we won all the trophies. We won that year eight or seven out of eight. We won. Um well, we had a team. My God, we had a team, you know. And yes. uh, But we coached them. We, I think for the first three months, we didn't get an afternoon off. We, we worked Saturday, Sunday. Worked every day. Mm. And that was new because at Sunderland, I'd probably get a Sunday off and a Wednesday off. Yeah. There was no chance at my United. And then I got a day off and I gave him a day off. We'd lost him on City the night before. And he called them all in. <laughs> he called them all back in. And we had to run around the pitch. We lost 3 1. And da- uh, with David May, he got sent off early. We lost 3 1. Very much when I said, Oh, Gaffer's brought him in. He says, I'll see you tomorrow. I thought, Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I went to see him and the honeymoon was over. And <laughs> <laughs> this is what we expect. That's not acceptable. You know, you're better than that. And if you've got a day off plan, you don't think you deserve it, don't give him it. And, you know, I was thinking about me having a day off, not <laughs> no, it, it was as good as gold. It was as good as gold. The best, the best I've ever been able to learn from. And the players, the example, the players with Ronaldo at the time, Van Nistelrooy, oh my God, you can, we, used to, we used to send the players over to sit and watch them sometimes. If they trained a bit longer, and I was just to see what they do and what's expected from them. And it was it was out of this world. Yeah. Good times. But I was, I, I, I'm, a boy, I'm a boy from a massive council estate in, Cl- in Glasgow, Castleville, and I'm thinking to myself, my God, you know, I'm in my United now. I'd never, ever <laughs> dreamed that in my life. You know, and, and it was it's the, first, it's the first time I've ever phoned somebody for a job. I've never done it. I've never done it. I always feel as if I owe somebody. But I've never done it. He was a good good pal of mine, and he, he managed to get me an interview. Well, it's funny. I mean, t- taking all that into account, fantastic time, fantastic people, fantastic education. You, it was kind of only really three years later when you you joined Sam Allardyce at, at Bolton Wanderers as first team coach, which you know you've just talked about. You know that you were learning on, on, on the job all the time. You were taking these fantastic players. So was that all about the opportunity to work with Sam Allardyce taking that job? Yeah, I, I think it, I think it was something to do with where I came from as well, to think it might be the only opportunity I have to work with a first team in the Premiership. Mm. You know, you don't know at my United, you know, if you are going to move up on that, you know, and um, and I thought, well, I'll, t- I'll take, I suppose it was a gamble, because deep down I didn't want to leave my United. Just didn't want to leave him because I loved it so much, you know, and uh, I enjoyed everything about it. But I thought I need to test myself, and, and there's not every day a manager phones you up and says they want you to go and train the first team in the in the Premiership. So, um, and a boy from Castlemore can, you know, where I've been and to where I am now, I've been really lucky and fortunate to be truthful with you, you know. And uh, I, I took the risk. I mentioned it to Sir Alex; he wasn't happy. You know, which I can understand, you know, and uh, but he let me go. You know, I did pay a bit of compensation, but um, but that, that was just the thought of maybe going up the level and, and testing myself, Chris, to see if I was up for it, if I could do it. You know, it's not until you get there do you really know can you do the job because it is different from a reserve team and into a first team because we at that time we had the JJ and the Carter, and then we had um, and Juffy, we, we had um. <laughs> um, Kevin Nolan, Kevin Davis, Delios, Campo. You know, you think, well, you know, this is just a lad that's come in. He's not been ever played at this level, uh, and he's he's telling you, asking you to do a few things different what what normally does. But Sam took me for because of my development um, on what I could do below as well for the the, the reserves and help the reserve coach, which I did. You know, and. Um, and also to help Sammy Lee. So I was working and Sammy was the assistant. I was sort of underneath, but helping Sammy as well. So it was it was an opportunity. And um, I went and spoke to Sam and he came over really well. I didn't know about Prozone and because we didn't do it at my United. You know, we didn't do anything like that at my United. And then about you know, scoring first in many games you won, and then corners for how important corners were, how important corners against were, and if you scored more goals for corners and this is this is a fact that and and, and uh, considered less goals from a corner. You'd be in the top eight. In eight three years, we were in the top. We were in the top eight. <laughs> so it was a completely different structure from what it was Manchester United. Yeah, was that the because I read um, Sam Allardyce's book and he talked a lot about his his kind of war room that he had at, at Bolton where it was all <laughs> set up and I mean were, were you part of that and did you see all how how that worked? Yeah, I mean it was a big circular table. Sam was like king at the top. He was a, he was like that. And then we had to do um, on the Monday. So they played Saturday. And the Monday afternoon, we had to do um, write down what we thought of the game. You know, we wrote stuff down that we thought and what went well, what didn't. Because he said, and in the war room, we had an opinion. We could say anything we wanted in the war room. It would stay in there. Because what Sam said, he said, uh, there's a lot of things in the game that I wouldn't think of or haven't seen that you might see. So, um, so we would be have an opinion, and I can remember sitting there, and I'm, there's me, Sammy Lee, there's Jimmy Phillips, um, obviously Sam, but there's other people. There was a kit man, 
Mm. You know, there was a kit man <laughs> and the laundry man and thinking. And I'm thinking, I think, well, you know, the academy director, the academy pro, I'm exaggerating with the laundry man. He wasn't there, but the rest <laughs> were there. <laughs> <laughs> And then the kid man's piped up, started talking away, and I'm thinking to myself, God, what's happening? You know, and, but he picked, Russell was good. Russell played at Blackpool and that. So Russell had a football background, and he would probably see things different from us. So Russell had yeah. say, like, I thought we were crap today. You know, I thought he was shy, and I thought he did this well. And then, uh, you know, so he'd write all that down. I don't, I don't know what he did with it. You know, he just say, I always make the decision, they're final. <laughs> but went, I ah, okay then. But, you know, sometimes they would just go, they would they would do like, they, you know, they, they'd speak to the player uh, over the international window, find out everything about, show him all his cuts and parts, how's he doing, how's his wife, when's the last time he'd been for holiday, when's he'd been away. Because you think there's a lot of French ones. Yeah. I mean, with Nicholas and Elkham, and when uh, with Borghetti, a, a Mexican centre forward, there was like, I think, Nakata, I think it was. There was 18 different nationalities, all speaking English. <laughs> I don't really think, God almighty, you know, but he had 18 players. That's all he had. And then we, uh, Vast Hayes came into the scene, you know, and uh, well, it was just complete. I mean, I can remember going to Man United and watch, watching a, a cup game. It may have been a league game with West Brom and, and four players were playing. I got invited and we went into the video room before the game, you know, they, they talked about West Brom, but it talked all about my United and showed three clips of West Brom. Well, Sam, we'd watch the 90 minutes and half of them were falling asleep. Jiffy would have fallen asleep. You know, <laughs> Raja Jaddy at the back would be falling asleep. You know, Matey was, <laughs> I was falling asleep. So I'm thinking, God, I mean, it's 90 minutes then. But it was completely different, different way of, of thinking. But for Bolton, it worked. It was really successful. Yeah, well, I mean, it was. I think it was a couple of years later after that. I think uh, two thousand and seven, when Sam Allardyce left, and he was replaced with with Sammy Lee. And then in the following November, um, Roy Keane kind of gives you a call to to take on the job as Sunderland first team coaches. And we we started life as a Premier League club after getting promoted at that point. But did you know Roy Keane pretty well from your time at Manchester United, or did that just? come out of the blue yeah I mean, we didn't know him to speak to you know like they sort of separated they were there and you, you wouldn't go in the first team dressing you know and you'd have to chat the door and get the okay to go in you might have to go oh, the gaffer wants to see somebody but you would never go in you know that was their sort of the area that was their zone you know you weren't allowed in that was the player's zone uh, Roy the, the, the end of the the year I was there he used to come in and ask us to uh, could he come in and listen to us at, uh, before the game half time and after the game when we played, you know, in the, um, in the league, and uh, sometimes you would see him after the game, or he maybe mentioned something the day after. But he came in for a little while just to see what we were saying and what points we were picking up, and he would disagree with some of the stuff. You know, that, that, that was fine, but I didn't really know him. You know, I may say hello to him. You know, that as far as I, I can. The, the, for me, go to Sunderland was was really John Cook, <laughs> the kit man. This Cookie phoned me up. He says, uh, Ricky Roy wants you to come to Sunderland. I went, all right, okay then. <laughs> I said, tell me about him. So he told me. Yeah, no, I should have stayed. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, no, so that, that's where it came from. And then I spoke to the, the secretary at the time in York. And then now Quinn phoned me. Quinn phoned me. And um, there was a wee bit of disagreement in the wages. You know, I usually find that if, if they send somebody from the admin saying or the, the secretary saying he doesn't really know who he's talking to mm. you know and he's mm -hmm. not so sure about this and that and he's got a set figure in his head and I've got a set figure that I think I'm worth there wasn't a lot between us I mean, no, no I don't think so I said well okay leave it I'll just stay in Bolton you know that's basically mm -hmm. what I said so Quinny phones off so don't worry it's all been done it's done and dusted uh, so I came I came and um, I looked after the defence and the set plays and Tony, Tony was the head coach and I sort of filled in between them and, and Roy yeah. was there so it was good really enjoyed it you know and uh, it was back to the club I, I've always liked it was something for them and for my first time there and I probably if it wasn't Manchester United uh, Chris I, I probably would at that time been still at Sunderland mm -hmm. to be honest with you I'd probably still be with Howard and 
you know, at the end of the day, I might have been sacked. But there again, I would probably still be at, at, at Sunderland. But um, yeah, it was nice to go back. It was just because uh, obviously the you know the back end of the year I left, they had the stadium, the training ground was all there, so everything was in place, you know, for success. You know, and um, it's um, it, it was a great feeling going back. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with Tony and I enjoyed working with Roy. You know, but I uh, also knew Cookie and I knew a lot of people there still. You know, I know, God rest his soul, Tim Carter, who was a fantastic goalkeeper yeah. and a lovely friend of mine. Um, and uh, so it was Jed McNamee, there was Elliot, you know, people like that. So Bolly was there, which was fantastic, was there. Um, so <laughs> it was it was nice to go back, you know, and yeah. it really hadn't changed a little bit. Different philosophy and what he wanted to play but um, and different players. But uh, yeah, it was good. I really enjoyed it. It was, I got offered, to be honest with you, in, in the June... Previously, I got offered to go back to uh, Bolton on a five-year contract. They offered me, I was in New Zealand, visiting some friends, and I got Gary Megson phoned me up and says, through Chris Evans, he says, I want you to come back, be head, head coach. Uh, there's a five-year contract for you. You know, and I, I mentioned that to Roy. I, was, I had a meeting with Roy in back end of June and just said, I need to do more. You know, I'm, I'm hungry to do more. And sometimes, you know, it, I'm not doing it as much as I, want to be doing and he said oh, I'll change you know I'll change you, you got more of it and I, I did a little bit but, so, but uh, I spoke Connie for me about that he said I want you I want you to stay <laughs> I went I okay then go on then I don't mind because <laughs> I, I when Connie you were saying about players when Connie and Phillips and yeah. Alex yeah. Ray and people like that and Connie was was fantastic and we had a spell we brought a lot of Irish kids and Connie was different class when we took them out looked after him and he was a, such a gentleman and he was good with me, I must admit. You know, he was fantastic when I was a coach there. Um, but they were all good, to be honest with you. But Quinny and I thought, you know, the pair, pair between Quinny and Kevin Phillips was outstanding. You know, a great match and complimented each other. Now, Quinn persuaded a lot of people to do a lot of things for Sunderland when he was when he was chairman, but, I mean, including kind of, persuading Roy King to, to, to come in as manager but you know obviously you, you might have seen him from a distance at uh, at Manchester United obviously with him being involved in the in the first team but um, I mean obviously I imagine you went into it with an open mind not having worked for him because that was his first job but uh, was he kind of as he worked as you expected because I mean from everything I've read and the things he said as well he seemed to take kind of a back seat of training and just kind of look watch the players from a distance rather than get involved yeah I mean I like Tony was sort of the head coach. So Tony would we'd sit down and discuss it with Neil Bailey. Um, we'd discuss what we were doing and what we needed to be run up. And Roy did take a background on it. And sometimes he'd join in. Um, and then sometimes he'd stop it and say, Look, I want you to do this or do that. You know, so he, he's t- he's, his thought in football was very good. He knew, because, I mean, they got promotion, didn't they? You know, they came from, they're not down at the bottom somewhere and then yeah. all of a sudden he got a promotion and then he wanted to drive on you know and obviously the, the, his coaching was good when he came and coached he did well you know he, he talked to you he asked you how the players were um, there was always that sort of form of communication with them uh, but Tony was the head coach Tony was probably the one that planned uh, the training for that week um, and then we'd go from there basically sort of take it from there and um if I had to do Chabond and people like that, I'd take him away and do extra with them, you know, or I'd maybe do Red Chabond and one day do, doing heading, but he'd have his hair back and, and it all be didn't he could head the ball because it was sore. So <laughs> we'd, we'd take him off one day. So, but um, it was, yeah, it was fine. It was okay. He, he was mm. maybe quite a private man as well. Listen, he's, he, he was a great player, you know, fantastic mm. player and great history of playing. And he, he tried to bring that into Sunderland. You know, he did try to bring it into that. You know, sometimes you, you might have, as I said earlier, you might have the same quality players as what we had at Man United. Well, you mentioned a couple of players were, were brought in that, that, that summer to try and kick on. Um, I mean, you've been on the training pitch. Did, did you, because there was all that group of players who kind of brought us up from the championship and he, he kind of tried to, you know, there was a big change over the just the, the one and a half years we were in the Premier League where he really tried to push us on. Did you feel the change on the training pitch with when, when he was bringing those players in that actually the, you know, you had to work on the that work, work ethic side as well as 
you know the quality players he was bringing in. I, I think you're trying to bring in a little bit of quality, you know, and and, and I think the work rate in general was, was fantastic with the players. Mm. And then it's sometimes a little bit of jealousy when you get a number of players coming in, you know, because there's that talk about wages and you don't know. They see know nothing what they're earning. I've never even asked them. I wouldn't want to ask them. And, you know, and they just get they look at it and think, oh God, he must be on a fortune. He's come here, and you know, and sometimes they get resentful. You know, some players regarding that, uh, but regarding honesty and all that was always there. You know, and um, and then, but they have a little bit different attitude. Like Jiffy had a different attitude. I knew him at, at Bolton, and I'd never met Chibonda. I'd heard things about him. You know, and mm-hmm. they were a little bit laid back, and yeah, we'll do it. You know, and things like that where. He'd, the Collins, you know, and uh, Whitehead, who were grafters, workers, battle for you, you know, every day. Mm-hmm. The, the other ones may have thought, well, no, I'll just sit back and I'll protect myself for Saturday, things like that. So they were a different nature of people in general, but uh, in general, they were fine. They were okay, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, CC was decent. You know, he was decent. Mm-hmm. He was a prolific goal scorer, you know, and uh, but I think it's always that jealousy. They, they, they read things in the papers. You know, and you think, oh God, I should be on that, and yeah, you know, I'm playing the first team, and it doesn't football isn't quite like that. Yeah, yeah, we had a we had a strange kind of mix of players by that that second season, and and he eventually kind of Roy King resigned after a four one defeat at home to Bolton Wanderers. Um, funnily enough, yeah. but um. I mean, I mean, because the Ellis Shaw came in before that, and there was a, there was always things kind of leaking out, little whispers, little stories, little rumours. But I mean, did did you and the rest of the staff? I mean, could you get a feeling things were kind of building up to a point where, you know, something m- might give, or or was it just a complete surprise out of the blue when he when he was out? Well, I think for me, it, it was a surprise because because he said to us, "We'll see you on the Monday," and mm. um, I was travelling up, and I think I was at. Probably just going over Middlesbrough Bridge. I was going over there, maybe up that way. And um, I got a phone call from Tony. And Tony said to me, um, uh, have you read the paper? He says, no, I haven't. I haven't read any news. I've like, not seen anything at all. He says, uh, just let you know, Roy's leaving. Or well, Roy's left. I went, oh, God. Well, what's caused that? He said, I couldn't tell you. That's what he said to me. So I mm-hmm. says, well, I'll be up there. It was about 7 o'clock. So I'll be up there for about maybe touching... Eight o'clock and have a chat. So we had a chat. Sat down, had a chat. He never explained why he, he left uh, Tony because Tony was very close to to Roy, and um, so Tony said, "I'll take the training. Yeah, that's fine. And then whatever, what do you want to do? And I'll take whatever's left. Or do we split them up? And so we organised the training for a couple of days, and then there was always this hope maybe it wasn't true. You know, he was going to just come back. It was just a spur of the moment." He made the decision, but um, I haven't ever f- known why. You know, if it was something to be really short, if he mm. felt as if he came to an end, or the result there on Saturday wasn't a great one for him, and things like that. So, but Tony was sort of, he probably knew a little bit more, Tony, because he was close to, to Roy. Uh, but uh, on that day, we just trained, you know, we just trained as normal. And um, then I think now spoke to Tony. And so I just went home. <laughs> I went home about half four. <laughs> I'll drive down home, and um, but still not knowing, you know, why or um, you know the chairman didn't speak to us about it. You know, uh, we, we knew now come up and spoke to to Tony, but um, that was you know I don't I don't know what was said there. I think now said to Tony just continue, continue how it's going, and then we're having a meeting that day. I think they were having. So that, that was as far as I knew, Chris. Yeah, and then following Saturday, you're in the dugout opposite Sir Alex Ferguson in Old Trafford, <laughs> which, you know, football <laughs> yeah. always writes these stories, doesn't it? Yeah. And you're, you're, you're our caretaker manager initially, um, obviously taking on Manchester United in the Premier League. I mean, was, was that kind of, because obviously, you know, kind of Tony was there and you were having conversations. I mean, did it seem natural for you initially just to, to kind of step into that role? No, not at all. I, don't, I didn't even... It didn't even come to my mind, I'll be honest with you. I just, I can remember now speaking to Disney, it could have been, I don't know if it was a Friday or Thursday. I know it was the, the snow was bad, I can remember that. And then um, he says, look, we want you to take over, just till we appoint somebody. So I said to him, what about Tony? Because Tony's a head coach. He says, no, I've just spoken to Tony, it's, it's been done, you know, it's, uh, we'd prefer you, you know. And so that, that that's how it was, you know. So we didn't, 
Chris, the, the club was in such a state, you know, we didn't have any money and stuff like that. And so we knew we were at Band United. We trained on the Friday on a 20 by 20 uh, piece of grass because it was snowing. We couldn't do anything else. And we made we played some games and a bit of fun and, you know, took the squad down and um, and lost late on. But I mean, we, we survived, you know, we, we'd done nothing with them. We just had set them out how we thought we needed to play. We tried to force the issue up front, but we couldn't do that because they're such a good team. The movement's great and things like that. Uh, I was sitting there with Neil Bailey and I said to Neil on the dugout, this is surreal, isn't it? Because he was my United. <laughs> Neil was there. So you had two as I sent here. So Alex in the other box. And with nil nil, we're about seven minutes to go. Would you believe it? He says, no, I wouldn't. I said, well, that's how things... I mean, lost one nil. And, you know, I saw... Um, now came in after the dressing room, thanked us all, you know, and uh, was a team as pleased as punch. And then uh, he said, We'll see you Monday, and that was it. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Monday, and uh, is this key team for another week? I said, Yeah, no problem, yeah, no problem at all, you know. And uh, we went to, I think it was it West Brom, I think it might have been, I think it might have been West yeah. Brom we played, mm-hmm. and we won, we won 4 1, and you know, I so, saw. I just said to him, well, the, the, one of the biggest problems is is managing all the players. We had something like 48 professionals. Yeah. And but what they don't understand, Chris, people they keep buying all these players, is that we can only name 18. Yeah. You know, because we can only play a living. So you know the rest of them are not going to be happy. You know, what I did say to him, we brought them in and said, look, we don't. Unfortunately, in this situation, I don't want to be in this situation. That's what I said to him. I said, I'm not a manager. I'm not looking forward to doing anything. I'm a coach, and as far as I'm concerned. And then I says, one thing I can do with you all. He says, what? I, said, I can trust you all. But I said, what you have to realise, I can't pick you all. It's impossible. Mm. You know, some are going to be disappointed. and But everybody will get your chance. I'll give you everybody a chance. That's, that's as fair as I can be. And I, and I said, I might be only here a week. I might be only here two weeks. And then hopefully they'll get somebody else in. You know, basically, I thought they may have got big salmon to be honest with some holidays, but um, it, it, you know, and you know, we got two good results, but I never ever thought, I never ever want, I keep saying it, and people say, Well, yeah, I've never wanted to be a manager, I know why I took the job, I know that now I know why I took the job at the time, I wasn't even so sure because he'd asked me that many times, I said no to him because I'm, I'm not a big name, I'm just a coach, I like to coach. You know, I'm quite prepared to do the caretaker until you get somebody else in, you know, but, you know, that's as far as it goes, as far as I'm in. This is if I got to go, I go. Because a new man, I want somebody in. I don't mind that. I don't have a problem with that, Quinny. Yeah. Just out of interest, just going back, because obviously that that was a, um, you know, it was a last gasp injury time winner from Vidic at Old Trafford. Um, but did, did Alex Ferguson have any kind of words of wisdom after after that game? Yeah, he, he just said, he just said, uh, I mean, we could have lost five or six, maybe seven. He says, he, he says, to be, he says, you he, he, he were well um, drilled. He said, you well drilled and you made it very difficult for us, you know. And um, what he did say to me, he phoned me up on the Monday or Tuesday, he said to me, I'll give you one piece of advice. I said, well, he says, get rid of your bad apples. Mm-hmm. I said, okay. You know, that was it, you know. And, uh, but we had, we had some, I think we had 48 professionals, all on good money, really good money. Um, but that wasn't my job to, to deal with that. My job was, as now I'd asked me to do, was just to coach them through the week, make it enjoyable, get them prepared for the game and take it from there. That, that was it, and keep us up. So he said to me, we need points, we need to stay up. That's what he said. And I said, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. Well, the, the, like you said, we went to West Brom and won 4-0, went to Hull City, won 4-1. You took us up to 12th from 18th when you took over just in the space of kind of three games. And I remember there, were, there was comments after the, you know, from the players to give you the job. I remember there was a clip on whether it was Match of the Day or Sky when you were doing an interview and the results were going right. I mean, did any of that start to, to sway you to think, mm, actually, you know, I, I could uh, I could have a crack at this or were your thoughts always the same? They were always the same. They were, they were actually the same because... When, when you become a manager, it does change. The players' thoughts of you change completely. When you're a caretaker manager, then everything's fine and great. And <laughs> we went to Hull and I can remember Quinny came in just before the game at Hull and says, oh, you have to beat this lot. 
I said, well, we're going to try. We're going to try and beat them. <laughs> he said, uh, he says, I've had enough upstairs, upstairs in the boardroom, all that they're talking about, you know, the Phil Brown philosophy and all that. I went, oh, OK, <laughs> I get the point. So <laughs> this is how we should do it. And I know Phil was after the job. And I mean, we won four. CC was, did really well for us and that. But there was never a time I ever wanted a job. There was never a time I sat down and thought, I desperately want this job. I didn't want it. I didn't want it because I, I thought suddenly needed somebody with a bigger name to attract bigger people to the club. That was always on my mind. I'm just not a nobody. I'm just a person that loves coaching, getting on with it. And I know why I took it, because Nal asked me. Nal just said to me, Can you you couldn't take it for me? That's what he said to me. I said, yeah, well, okay. And this was after about two and a half days. He said, it'll give us time. I said, yeah, but now it will change. The whole thought of me will change with the players. Because when you're a caretaker, you're just a caretaker. You know, at the end of the day. And I said, as soon as I come the manager, it's going to change. I'll tell you that now. It'll go the other way. You know, players have been moaning. We need to get some players in and they're not happy. And I know we sat down and he said, can you give us a list of players we need to keep? So I gave him 28. You know, and that was including Callback and Henderson and Wycorn. And, and this is the ones we had to sell to, to bring money into the club, to bring it in. And we couldn't bring anybody else to help us. You know, just couldn't do that. You know, it was... People don't realise what situation we're in at the time. But um, so now I said to me, look, please do it for me. I said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Because I know now we're stumbling through and through. And in a way, I was stumbling through and through. And, um, mm. But Chris, I never discussed wages, nothing at all. I didn't discuss a contract, nothing at all. I just mm. got on with the job and tried to keep us up. And that was even, you know, the, the owner was saying to us, you know, through now, we need to stay up, you know, and, and that's what we had to do. And, and it wasn't pretty. We, we had a dip. We know that. And the Tottenham game was a, a we won up with Tottenham with a minute or so to go and we, we carried away and George McCartney went up for a corner who shouldn't be up there. We told Mal Black to take a shot. He put it in the box and then they went up and scored and Keane scored. I thought, oh God, that would have been three points. That would take us out of the, the pressure uh, premiership as well. It was even when I took it, you know, and I used to speak to Nal every day and I said to Nal, no matter what happens now, I'm leaving the summer. So that was, yeah, that's yeah. where we, we sort of left it, you know, and yeah. and I said, I'll promise to do everything I can. You know, the hours to work and try and bring a couple of new, we brought Davenport in, who was a good one, we brought Tal by M, who was decent, you know, and uh, we brought Paul McShane back, who wasn't happy. And, but Ham's football isn't always happy and decisions are not always right. And, but they were decisions I thought were right at the time, but... Um, it, everything was all about staying in and people not losing their jobs and mm. the staff there who I've known for years may have possibly lost their jobs as well I didn't want that I just didn't want it uh, but you know, the players could move and agents would get them away and sell them and stuff like that so it was it was difficult it was a difficult time Yeah well th- th- there was also the, the small matter of a, a derby against Newcastle at St James's Park ah. Which is, I mean, it don't, no matter how you're involved, is always a huge game, obviously, you know, up, up our way. But um, from the viewpoint of a manager, how did you find the build-up? Was it just something you couldn't really enjoy and get into just because that the pressure's just so big in, in games like that? Yeah, I, I didn't read the papers. I'll be honest with you, I didn't, because I live in New York. I got even press down here. Didn't really know I did. Um, so I didn't really <laughs> read the papers. And we, we had a fair idea what we were going to play. We spoke to, to Neil and that and discussed it. And um, I'd never been to Newcastle. Oh, no, I had been. Sorry, I'd been because uh, that was when Kevin Phillips scored the little lob. Where they won yeah. 2 0, I think it was a 2 1. Um, yeah. And then we got off to a good start. And then Stephen Taylor went down. The Eiffel Tower, and I know Stephen. I know Stephen really well. And he said to me after the game, I'm really sorry, Vicky. I said, Yeah, it's, it's football. We just got to go away. We had a chance with um, Chopra. It broke through. Um, yeah, yeah. And they just squared it better. And they never, I don't think, Kevin got a hold of it. But we, we, it was the same as Middlesbrough, Chris. We couldn't afford to lose the game. We had to pick up points, which was really important to us. And then we changed the team around and then there was a couple of injuries and stuff like that. So it, it, it was, the Newcastle game it was the hype of it. You know, what they were going to do is and they were going to beat us and all that. But we, we were confident we'd get something from it. And I, and I felt on the day we, we possibly could have got a win. Yeah. 
yeah, that uh, like you said, that late latest penalty, about twenty minutes left, got them a point. Um, but on the last day of the season, finished sixteenth in the Premier League. Newcastle were relegated, so yeah. one or two set, one or two celebrations going on. Um, and like you said, you you kind of already made your decision up, but you know we're and and you, I think everything you've said was, you know, at the at the time you didn't want it, you know, you didn't want to do that, you didn't want to take that step. We're kind of what I think we're. 10 11 maybe 12 years on now i can't quite remember but does any any part of you now look back and think you know who who knows where i might have went no no not at no. all i um when i left i spoke to now and said Look, i'm going to leave now you know i've said that to you at christmas time mm. and he said um have you made up your mind i said yeah i said you need somebody with a bigger name who can attract players you know i filled in the gap you know, it needed to be filled in and then uh, then somebody else can take over. I know Darren Bent came because of the money we saved him, you know, but um, I love my time there, you know, and I know you get slaughtered, but that's football. You know, that's part of football. You read, I don't actually read the papers. I tell my wife, don't read the papers because it's not, it's going to be critical, a lot of it, you know, and uh, but we have this thought, we have to stay up and then that's what we're going for. Um, but... Um, I know, I know when Steve Bruce phoned me up, he said to me, can you have come in and have a chat with me? Because when, when Nal Quinn said to me, oh, you got a job for life, I said, you can't give anybody a job for life. You just can't <laughs> do that. It's impossible. You know, and I wouldn't want that, Chris. I just wouldn't want that. It wouldn't be fair. Mm. Um, and then Steve phoned me up and says, I might have a little job for you. And I says, look, Steve, is it, I might have a little job because Nal Quinn said, I think we should give Ricky a job. He went, no, 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 no. I said, okay, I'll come and have a chat. And then uh, what it was, it just never looked through the scouting. That's basically what it was. So it was a good three months for me, four months for me uh, to do. And went into Amsterdam and a couple of countries. But you have to be realistic that these top players are not going to come to Sunderland. Mm-hmm. Be honest with you, Chris. You know, you're watching all these Ajax players. <laughs> They're not going to come. <laughs> They're just not going to come, you know. But, um, yeah, so that was good. And then... After that, I um, I packed in and I, I got, funny enough, Chris, I got offered a job at Newcastle. <laughs> uh, funny enough, to take their under-18s. This, yeah. is, this would be maybe September, October time that year. But I'd already said yes to the Scottish FA to be a national yeah. coach. So when I gave my word, I gave my word. You know, I could have pulled out of it, but I didn't think it was right. Um, but regard that, listen, I love the club. I love the people. The fans are extraordinary. Um, I know a little bit about the manager they've got now, Lee. I know a lot about him because I met him on my my pro license, mm. and um, he did offer me a job, Lee, not at Sunderland. <laughs> he mm. offered me a job. We were doing a pro license. We were in Turkey. Don't feel remember it, and we're having a couple of jars, and mm. we're doing this sort of analysts on these games, and uh, it was a World Cup, and um, he said to me, uh, "I've got been offered a job at." Uh, at Oldham. I went, oh, brilliant. I didn't know Lee. I met him just on the, the, the course. He says, do you fancy coming in as my assistant? <laughs> and I went, no, I don't. <laughs> he says, why not? I, says, I said, because oh, you've asked four people before me and I'm the fifth person you've asked. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. I says, no, I'm quite happy where I am. But uh, yeah. he'd done, he done the pro did two years with his pro license with him. He's a lovely, he's a lovely chap. I went back. Monty invited me back to watch a couple of games as a guest. And it was lovely. It was lovely to go back and see a lot of the, the stewards that I knew, um, you know, and, and faces that, you know, I hadn't seen for years. And they're still there supporting the club and loving it and working their tails off to make the club better. And the, and the club is lovely. You know, they've been through bad times. You know, that's you know that's how football is in general. But uh, my, my time at the club, even the six months, it was hard work. You know, my health went deteriorated badly, but it, it was worth it to keep them up. You know, I can remember Ian Dowie saying something. He was he was on Sky, maybe in Sky, and he said something about when he joined Newcastle. He said, um, I've got a lot of experience at this level, which, you know, keep me, keep me good and, you know, I know where we're going. But he actually, before that, he got three teams relegated. From the leagues, so I thought, well, that's not a bad thing, you know. So, you know, I thought it's a good chance. It's a good chance to make it relegated, but 
the home in good stead. You know, uh, I've had these situations, but he didn't see the three clubs he took down get relegated. But uh, but no, it, it was fantastic. And, and yeah. even on the night, we went out on Sunday and Quinny had a few beers, Quinny, and, you know, we felt good. It felt good because we stayed up. And, and no matter what and what health damage it cost me, it was worth it. Everything was worth it. And, you know, and even made me even think I couldn't, couldn't be a manager again. I don't know how to do it, Chris. I honestly don't know how to do it because <laughs> on the first day I got the job, I got 169 calls, missed calls on my phone that people don't even know my phone number. Mm. So that was the start of it. And I showed it to Quinny and Quinny went, I'll deal with it. <laughs> I said, oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was it was fantastic. The club, I love the club. You have a lot of time yeah. for the club, and you know I may have only been there for the, that short spell, but I didn't want to be a manager. I couldn't be a manager, Chris, of a club when the team gets relegated and say the following season, oh, we'll get them back up because you've worked hard enough to keep them up. That's what they say. Just when I hear that, I think God Almighty, you know, we're going to work really hard to get back up and all that. We should work really hard to keep them in the league. You know, that's how I see it, but that's how it is. That's how, that's how I thought it might not make any sense, but to me, it, it makes a little bit of sense that people after the after get relegated say, Oh, well, you know, we'll get back up again. You know, it's, it's a certainty, it doesn't always happen. Yeah, well, like you said, but when you left, you spent kind of five years with the, the SFA, with the under 17s, under 19s, and the under 21s with Scotland. And then in 2017, you joined Manchester United to take on um, the, the job of the under 23s. Mm-hmm. Now, I just want to I just want to ask you at this point, because you mentioned a lot at Sunderland and you talked about Manchester United in your first spell about the, the Central League and the old reserve team structure. I mean, what's your thoughts on after having the, you know, you took the reserve team at Sunderland, you took the reserve team at Manchester United, and now kind of, the under twenty threes at Manchester United years later. What's your thoughts on kind of the old reserve team structure where young players used to get that chance to play against more experienced players versus the current under twenty three structure where when you go and watch them it seems like sometimes they're just going through the motions and there's no real competitive edge to it. Um do you think do you think kind of the, the system's changed too much in one way? I, I, I would I would prefer it when the first years of my age to go to two oh five. We, we, we played like an under-18 team in an open age league. Mm. And, and I preferred that because it was great experience for them to play against these experienced players and try and learn the game. Um, I know the under-23s, I might be wrong, might have a few overage players over it, but um, we we would prefer that. At my United, we'd have preferred that, you know, to play against these experienced players, you know, and, and teach our young players what it's all about. Um so I would, I would actually prefer an open age league. And I, I know they've started to do it a little bit. I know Sunderland played Manchester United um, about a couple of weeks ago and yeah. uh, Sunderland won 2-1. And that was like the 21s playing maybe 22s, 23s, you know, and maybe a couple of senior players, which, which I think is good. But I know when I played, uh, I can remember playing against Charlie George. You know, I can remember that. I can remember playing against a player at Reading called Charlie Hurley, not Charlie Hurley, um, oh God, what's his name? I can remember him punching me. I can remember me running, I kicked him and he says, you won't do that again. I think his name, and he punched me. I ran out, cleared the ball, ran out, and I woke up about four days later. He just hit me. And that was me. But, uh, and then you could try to get used to that. But I think this like for like, 18s play 18s, and I'd like 18s play 20 odds, you know, and do it that way. I'd like an open age, but, and I'd like the league to get bigger. I'd like the, the Premier League to be two, uh, the same league, you know, so you will probably get something like 20, you know, maybe 24 games, 28 games or 30 games. So you've got a season as well, you know, and I'd prefer that, but I know they've got like Division 1 and Division 2, but I'd, I'd prefer when it's all together. You know, I can remember the football combination. We went to Plymouth. You know, we went down as far as that. We, we played West Ham, we played Arsenal, we played Chelsea, yeah. we played all the clubs, you know, and there was something like maybe 17 teams. And it was great. And it was open age. So I'd be a 17-year-old playing against maybe a 28-year-old and learning the trade, trying to learn it. But um, I'd prefer it to be slightly open age. Yeah, I I remember going to watch all of the Sunderland Reserve games and, and every game seemed like a, a proper game, whereas... 
don't know, the, the under 21s now the it's it's a very it's very technical but in mm-hmm. terms of a competitive edge i don't think you see a tackle <laughs> no no that don't allow to tackle now it's just you know just I, I i would prefer for them you know if you're saying to we are talking if you go back to my United, you're talking about you know that even mm-hmm. michael son of michael Proctor would have played in the mm-hmm. reserves at 17 at open age league which would pref- prepare him for the first team you know, because he could be playing against a 27, 20 year old. And we say to him, How did you find it? You know, what did he do? He said, Oh, he bossed me, or he got into the channel early and he stopped me going to my right. You know, little things like that. So you, you would ask him questions. Um, and then I think they learn from it. You know, where they play like for like, it, it could be it could be just too easy for him, too simple for him. But I mean, that's my thought. I'd, I'd prefer open age. Yeah. Yeah, I've 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 had those thoughts, but when I when I say them out loud, I just sound um, <laughs> just sound old. But uh, but there you go. But um, but you you left Old Trafford in, in May twenty nineteen. Then kind of you know just less than a year later, the pandemic kicked in. Um, so kind of what what, what you've been up to since Old Trafford, the the job at Manchester United when you left there, and um, are you are you kind of tempted at all? I know we've we've spoke kind of before we recorded about you spending time with your grandkids and your family because big long. Career in football takes a takes your time up. So do you feel like you'd you'd get back in? No, I think I think I mean my chess is the, the second time didn't go so well. You know, we, we got mm. relegated the first year. Um mm. and then the second year we were up there and but the problem is what people don't realise is that on, on, on the first year, when it come to Christmas, we lost like eight players from the team. And the other players were coming through weren't quite ready. And the second year was the same, we lost ten players out and alone. So it's difficult, you know, we're what you probably find, Chris, is that teams will play my United and play the, play the all of experienced players. Yeah. And we're playing 17 year olds who have not really should be playing reserve football yet. Yeah, they're just not quite ready for it. But because we we let 10 out alone, they were probably the, 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 the 20 year olds and probably the, you know, sort of the 19 year olds or 21 year olds, then it, 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 there's a big gap. So it, it, didn't, it didn't work too well for me uh, on that then. And it was really down to that. And I, and I spoke to Nikki when I first took the job over, because when I left the Scottish FA, that was it. You know, I, I'd, I'd come to the stage where you think I'm travelling to Glasgow, I'm living in Glasgow, you know. And Manchester was fortunate, I had a flat Manchester, which helped me with Burnley, and then uh, which helped me with Bolton. But the rest of the time, I'm still commuting. You know, for me to get yeah. to Manchester, uh, what I had to leave at quarter past five in the morning Oof. to get past the 62 to get into work. Yeah. And then come back at half five and get in at seven. And I'd go to bed at half nine. Yeah. I'd be knackered, absolutely knackered, you know. So it was unfair. And when I took the job, I'd said to Nicky about, we, Neil Wood was there. And I, Neil Wood was a player when I was there. And he, he, I'd mentored him. And he was ready for the job. So Nicky offered me another job, to be fair, within the club. But I, I'd said no. If I'd lived in Manchester, I probably would have. But because it was New York, I thought maybe it was about time to spend some time at home. You know, and see my wife now and again. You know, and see how she is, and you know, and <laughs> when we when we did a break international, we were away for two weeks. You know, and yeah. things like that. And she's put up it since probably ninety four since I moved to Sunderland. You know, and I thought, well, I'm sixty five. I thought, well, maybe I was going to retire at fifty. I wasn't going to be doing the Scottish FA things and all that. And I thought, well, it'll be different. And it was different because it wasn't every day. It was just that 10-day period in international week or two weeks. That was fantastic. But then I did miss the everyday stuff. <laughs> so it was, yeah. it was a bit... So I, I didn't apply for my United job. I just got a phone call asking, would I be interested? And I said, yeah, I'll come down. And I'm going to spoke to you about it. I said, well, can I do it for two years? Three max. If it's not, then fine. I, I, that's okay. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. You know, so... But it didn't go well. It didn't go as well as the the first time I went there. And, and it's all down to quality. The same quality of player wasn't there when I first was in 03 to 05. Although now they're spending a little bit more money competing with the Man Cities and the Chelsea's and you know, uh, for young players. And they've got to be you know, where previously when I was there, they would come automatically because of the badge and really because of the manager. Yeah. He had a big part to do with a lot of players. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it wasn't what I'd hoped for. But you know, I think it was a time I had to say that that's enough. You know, the, the, yeah. books, the boots are in the garage and that's it. They're staying in there, and, <laughs> you know. And I, I went to work, listen to Phil Neville, you know, down in um, 
St George's, a couple of things here, and I've asked to be doing a couple of things, but I haven't done it, to be fair, uh, Chris. I thought I'll just try and keep well away from it all, you know, and spend a bit of time. And I've got a couple of things in my wall. I did tell you last night, I've got my beer mats, yeah. which shows <laughs> Quinny and Michael Gray and Kevin Phillips that I put up the other week, or maybe three weeks ago, would normally sit in my drawer, and I thought, I've got my wife lets me put a couple of things in here. But I've got three things in football in my house, and that's it. <laughs> So, no, but it's been good. The other thing's been good because it stopped, it stopped me driving, you know, and you you, you live, you live the six months in uh, Sunderland, every day I live for the job. Mm. You know, it was always in my mind. I couldn't sleep. I was worrying. The results weren't going so well. And then the players have doubts. And I'm just glad on the day it uh, we managed to, to survive. You know, because if it didn't, I couldn't go back to someone. I could never, ever go back to someone. I'd let them down, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's difficult. Well, well, I mean, j- just on a on a final note about Sunderland, because um, we'll finish on Sunderland, because you had, a, obviously, the couple of spells at the club. And actually, the, I mean, the first one saw a huge like transformation of the club, really, in the late 90s. We completely changed as a, as a club and what, what we were and kind of what we are now. Um well, well, what we are now, what we turned yeah. into when you were there, but, but I mean, what what goes through your head now when when you see Sunderland in League One? I'm I'm sad. I'm, I'm and, and don't get me wrong, and, and there's a lot of great British coaches in the country and managers, mm. and they don't know the history of Sunderland. A lot of them, you know, and I think they brought a couple of managers in that shouldn't have been there. Personally, that's my thought of it, you know, and. Mm. You know, when you get these managers in, they bring all their own people, and then they all start talking their own language. And it becomes difficult, you know, really difficult. Um, and I think that was one of the reasons as well. And, and I think the biggest reason was Nal Quinn leaving. I think if Nal Quinn had stayed, I think they'd be still in the championship. You'd be up that way. You know, they'd be back into it there, thereabouts. But um, for me, he was a rock at the club. You could go and speak to him. He was always accessible. He, he, he loved the fans. He was always available to him. And I think when he left, he, he, for me, he was a great chairman. You know, he was a fantastic chairman and he, um, he loved the club. He loved the city. You know, he spent a lot of time out, uh, in Sunderland rather than being at home. And from my point of view, when he left, I think I was a big minus for Sunderland Football Club. Yeah, it was. It was. It definitely, definitely can't do the change after that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's been difficult for anyone to watch football over the the last eighty months and travel around. But uh, and you said you you were kind of you've made a a trip to Sunderland since. But um, I mean, now things have opened up a bit more. I mean, would fancy making a kind of a few trips up to see a few games in at the stadium? Yeah, I'd probably give Bali a phone. <laughs> I'd probably give Bali a phone. <laughs> the infrastructure is there. There's everything there. Like a lovely ground and a fantastic training ground. I don't know the, the owner, but it seems a, it seems to be a lovely block, you know, and he's got these ideas and the manager's good. Lee's good and I think they'll go up this year. When the, you know, and I think the championship then they obviously have to adapt to that. So that maybe buy more players and things like that, but they'll get the crowds. You know, and I think the Sunderland fans have, have, have went through hell. And they always go through hell, and they've always been through hell. And mm. They always come back rejoicing. You know, I do think that. Yeah, he said. Well, the new owner certainly makes me feel old, having an owner who's only twenty four. <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, that's a that's a different talking point uh, altogether. But uh, but yeah, it'd be great to see you at the stadium, yeah. and hope, hopefully you can pay us a visit at some point. But on that note, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you about your your career, Ricky, uh, and thank you very much for for taking the time out for us. We we'll really appreciate. No it. problem at all, Chris. It was the joy. I loved it. I'll, I'll go back to my glass of wine now. it's been absolutely fantastic and and thanks again thank you again for everyone out there who's listening hope you enjoyed that as much as I did and keep a look out at all the usual places for our next pod dropping subscribe and like and, and all of that sort of stuff but from us it's bye for now